All right. It is my honor today to welcome Be Real, lead vocalist of Cypress Hill, one of the greatest hip hop groups of all time, the first Latino hip hop group to go platinum, selling over 20 million albums, the first Latino hip hop group to have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and also hip hop's biggest advocate when it comes to the legalization of marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to Vlad TV. Welcome. Thank you, cousin. Thanks. You, thank you for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> this is our second time, but it's been it's been about maybe seven years since our last one. Yeah, it's been a minute. It's yeah, been a minute. we got to hang out a little bit during that time. Yeah, I was you know smoking dabs backstage <laughs> at one of your Halloween shows. Oh man, I'm still high. I think from that from that night. Man, dabs, they're lethal. Oh you yeah, you know you got to build tolerance for some dabs. Oh yeah, so I salute you for even going that <laughs> even far. Try right. Yeah. <laughs> Me and you actually have a picture from that night backstage where we look like twins. Yeah, when yeah. we was twinning. Yeah, you know, if I was to get the full deal, yeah, you totally we, look like you look like again. me again. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've interviewed you before, but I really want to get into the whole Cypress Hill story because yeah. we have a little more time this time. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning. So. You have a Mexican father and a Cuban mother. Right. Were they immigrants? My mother was an immigrant. My father was born in, this, in the United States, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, history serves me correct within my family, yeah. His, his, uh, his parents were born in Mexico, but they would go you know, back and forth to, um, to um, where was it, Chihuahua and, and Durango and, and all those different places. They go back and forth from there to Arizona. And uh, so, you know, my father, you know, is Mexican American, but you know, his his uh, his parents were were born in Mexico, grandparents and all that stuff. So, but he was born here. Okay, your mom's emigrated and, from and, Cuba. Yeah, and my mother escaped from Cuba. Escaped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, she didn't have a, a normal immigration. She uh, she didn't immigrate here, you know, the way some Cubans were able to. She had to escape. So she got on a boat. And basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ended she, up in Miami somewhere. Yeah, pretty much a raft. A raft. Yeah, yeah. She had to escape a prison, one, because she was a, a political prisoner mm. at a very young age, and one of her um, uncles worked in the prison, and he helped her escape, made her a makeshift raft. That's how she got off the island. Wow. She was found by like a fishing boat. You know, uh, maybe a day or two later, crack skull, the whole shit. Oh, wow. And they helped her get into uh, one of the ports. Might have been New York that she came through first. I'm okay. not sure. Or like uh, the boat was obviously, you know, between Cuba and, and Florida. But somehow I think they ended up in New York at the end of the trip. I don't know how that happened. But, you know, that's how she got here. So did she... Was she speaking out against Castro? Yeah, pretty much. And that's why she got locked up. Yeah. So does your family have this real hatred towards Castro? Uh, well, you know, pretty much, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's like anyone who escaped yeah. um, the communism that was happening there through Castro. Yeah, they don't have anything good to say <laughs> about, oh, yeah. about dude. You know, I mean, if you watched a, a few years back or maybe it was six now, when they were announcing, you know, the possibility of his death, you know, all the Cubans that were celebra celebrating in the street in, in Florida, I mean, you know, that's that's real shit. Cause I mean, you know, he executed a lot of people's family members. Yeah. You know, and yeah. uh, he was uh, one of those uh, guys that, uh, yeah, unless you were brainwashed by him and you lived there, you didn't, you didn't like him at all. Yeah, I mean, I, my family, got to move away from communist Russia. Yeah. And I heard how bad it was over there. Yeah. You don't want to be in one of those communist systems back no, you then don't. in the 70s and 80s. Like, you just absolutely do not. It was really yeah. like hell. It doesn't living. work. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. And you grew up in Southgate? So, well, I moved around Los Angeles a lot, but I spend time, a lot of time in Southgate, which is where I met Send Dog and his brother, Mello, mm -hmm. and uh, w which is where we started the Cypress Hill you know, group, band, whatever, movement, vibe. But yeah, I moved around to LA a lot. I lived in East LA, all over parts of uh, that side and, you know, South Central, Gardena up in the, and towards the South Bay, man. I moved around a lot. 
I know this city like the back of my hand, you know? It's crazy. Well, your dad was actually uh, shot at one point. Yeah. 12 times? 12 times, yeah. Well, what was that about? Well, you know, Pops was into to some shit that he didn't necessarily speak to us about. I, I suppose maybe a couple of my older brothers maybe knew what was going on, but you know, he was involved with some some serious people and uh, a dispute happened amongst them, I believe, you know, as far as the story that's told to me. And, uh, you know, my father was uh, a truck driver and, uh, you know, he had his own trucking company and stuff like that. And they would, you know, um, transport copper and other goods from A to B and whatnot. And he had other partners and he had, you know, friends that were, into some different things, if you will, right? And it, within that dispute, some tension happened. And, you know, the, one of his uh, boys that, that was like, uh, he considered a mentor to him, who the, the tension was arising with, uh, came down to his spot and shot him 12 times and shot uh, two of the co-workers at uh, my father's trucking company. And, uh, you know, it was still un still we don't really know what that dispute was over but you know my father was a g he made it through he didn't he didn't die off that off that uh 12 shot sitting you know he had it, it's crazy because he got shot six times by one one uh caliber when dude unloaded and my father got up off the ground he cracked dude to give himself enough time to you know try to run away as he was running away Dude grabbed his other shit and shot him in the back six times. And, uh, you know, my father was a heavy set dude. He was maybe six feet, 300 pounds. So he had a lot of meat on him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Enough to get across the street to this diner that was, uh, that was across the street from the, the trucking company where, you know, they saw him bloodied up and he passed out on the counter. They call the, the cops. Well, that's happening dude walks through to see if there's any witnesses shoots another dude in the back paralyzes him for the rest of his life and uh while they were operating on my father he had like two heart attacks on the on the operating table lived through that shit. i mean you know we were all we all thought he was he was done i mean 12 bullets two heart attacks two different calibers one you know i believe was a 22 so he had shit bouncing around in him um but he was tough and and he made it through that shit and uh i remember they were asking him you know to press charges against dude and he wouldn't do it really yeah he was like nah i'm gonna find him at another point and i'm gonna deal with him that way he chased him through the court through the court um you know when they when they saw each other when they were going to court for the first time and my father was well enough to you know move around he tried to chase dude through the courts and the sheriffs <laughs> had to like get between him. But yeah, you know, my father grew up that way. He wasn't going to press charges on dude. He wanted to get him. It, the funny thing is, <laughs> the funny part to that story and nothing, uh, not, no part of it's actually funny, but the irony is, is when my father didn't press charges, they didn't have a case against the dude, right? Mm -hmm. So dude, he was an older man. He threw a party um, that night that, that you know they they dropped the charges on him and he wasn't gonna have to go to prison or anything. He fucking had a heart attack at his party, died at his goddamn party. Wow. Yeah. And then his son, out of you know, his son blamed my father for this and tried to take shots at my father later on. The guy's son tried to shoot at your dad. Yeah. Later on, like maybe I'm gonna say five, ten years later, he came looking for him at a, a at a business my father was working at. Um. <laughs> and he came and tried to, you know, get a, get a drive by going on on my father. That's he crazy. He didn't hit him. Yeah. But you know, my one of my nephews caught up to him and gave him the business and beat the shit out of him for that one. But yeah, I mean, that's that's you know, <laughs> whatever my father was into. I mean, I could assume what the type of shit he was into. But you know, that's that's how that's how it all transpired with him. You know, we we were all shocked at homie died from the heart attack but even more so just the 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 sheer strength of of my father to make it through that you know i'm one of 
14 siblings. You know, my father was married three times. So I got half brothers, half sisters. And, you know, we were all, you know, tripping the fuck out. I mean, they had to send me and my sister in hiding because we were having threats on, on our family and stuff like that because of that shit right there. We would get calls like, we're, we're going to get your father in the hospital and all kinds of shit like this. I mean, we, <laughs> I grew up in the shit early, man. Yeah. You know, and um, it, it, it just sort of opened my eyes to people and, and, and the shit that you choose to do. Well, at one point you joined the neighborhood family bloods. Yeah. Which I guess also family swan bloods. Yeah. Known today. Mm -hmm. um, were you kind of following in your dad's footsteps in a way? Or no, no. Because really? that was something he was not, not down with at all. Like one of my older brothers, you know, he, he was in gangs too. We're, we were the only two. My father, his, his shit was not gang related. It was something deeper, you know. He would never tell us, but it, it had it was something deeper than than gangs, right? Uh, my brother, he was involved with gangs. He went with Latin, you know, with the with the Latin gangs with brown folks. Um, I I went a different way, you know. I lived in a different neighborhood. I hung out with different cats than my older brother. You know what I'm saying? Different times, and um, you know, I connected with my homies from from uh, families through Send Dog. You know, he went to school with uh, one of the homies down there. And every now and then when he'd go visit homie in the hood, I'd go with him. And I started, you know, being friends with a lot of these homies and shit like that we connected on, on different things. And I was a youngster. There was a lot of motherfuckers older than me and there was motherfuckers my age, obviously, because with the gang, you have all sorts of different ages. Motherfuckers that want to get in early or that are born into it early, you know me? Because of my family background, I just sort of naturally went, fell into it. You know, it was something that uh, I had a choice. It, it wasn't like no one was not giving me a choice like, hey, you need to be down with this or else this or that. It was something I chose. It called to me and I went to it. And, uh, you know, even though it was like something totally different than what my brother was doing with the Latin gangs. You know, I got a lot of shit for it too, being, you know, appearing more Latin than anything. Um, I got shit for that, you know, but I didn't give a fuck cause I was down from my hood. I was down from my homies. They were down from me. And it was, uh, it was basically an extension of, of, of family to me. You know, I, I couldn't relate to other people the way I could with these homies. And even though we were into some bad shit, it was it was that connection. We all looked out for each other. But that's that's how that's how it happened. You know, pretty much Send Dog was was, uh, you know, homies with 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 some cats down there. And he was affiliated with them to a degree. And then he introduced me to them and I became a full fledged, you know, member of, of that neighborhood. Right. Well. For the longest time, the Sorenos and the black gangs in LA had always been at war. Yeah. There's always been tension. Yeah. So, but here you are, a kid who looks Mexican. Yeah. Even though you're half Mexican, but yeah. you look Mexican. Right. But you're a part of the Bloods. Yeah. So, what happens when you guys run into the Mexican gangs? We rarely ran into any Mexican gangs. At that time, it was very like, you know, we stood in our neighborhood, they stood in theirs, and we even had homies that were from Mexican gangs. I mean, there was a, a Mexican homie that was there before me. He moved out of the hood and, and, and moved somewhere else, but he was like the first Mexican homie that was banging with them. Hmm. And, and at that time, most Mexican homies was banging with Crips. Out, you know, there was very few of us <laughs> really banging with Bloods. Um, yeah, but you know, it was tough because, you know, when, whenever we get you know, rolled up on crash or, or, uh, any LAPD of any types, man, they'd be fucking with me off the top. Like, what are you doing around here with these guys? Mm. And, you know, I'd, I'd have to be extra and I'd get fucked with extra, you know, but, uh, that, the, the tension that between black and brown, you know, it wasn't necessarily as much on the street as it was in the prisons at that time. It, it, it leaked over into the streets much, much later. You know, so like if the, 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 the thing that would have happened is 
had I gone to serve any serious time, you know what I mean, um, as an adult gang gang member, or whatever, and I'm Mexican, I would have had to de dealt with anything that was the 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 racial tension that was happening in the prisons at the time. I would have to have chose a side and then make a you know deal with the consequences of that choice. So if, because I'm Mexican. I would have to roll in that, you know, on that side. And if I don't, I'm gonna get rolled up by these dudes. If I choose to roll with the bloods, I'm gonna get rolled up. <laughs> either, either way, I'm gonna get rolled up because one side feels I should be roll, rolling with them. And because I'm a blood over here, they feel like, nah, man, you should be over here with us. And so there would be a conflict. Any anyone who's like me in any of those gangs has to fucking deal with that. And some choose the gang they're from over like what they are. Like you'll see it. And sometimes those guys got to deal with it, you know? Right. Well, the the Mexican mafia, um, what's his name? Pegleg? Yeah. Who was white. Right. Was one of the founding members right. of that, and he stayed on the Mexican side. Yeah, he could have joined he, yeah. all the Aryans and everything else like that in prisons, but he stayed on the Mexican side the whole time. Yeah, yeah, and you know he was high up, very and high they, up, and they protected him. You know what I mean? So you know that's that's a different story. When you're just a soldier, you don't get that same type of protection. You may, depending, you know, on the type of homies you have around you. But it's 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 not easy being <laughs> of another ethnicity in in a gang, you know. Like if you're if you're a Mexican in a black gang, or you're a black dude in a in a Mexican gang, or a white guy in a Mexican gang. There's all sorts of politics, man. But you know, if if you're well respected and high up there, and one of the shot callers, yeah, ain't nobody gonna fuck with you. But if you're a soldier, you might get fucked with. Yeah, I interviewed Danny Trejo, who was actually good friends uh with peg leg yeah and he was saying how like 10 people died over the movie american me yeah over like the depiction of the the leader getting raped and yeah some of the other stuff and from what i understand some of the people featured in that movie like i think like a lot the, of them got killed because of them being in that movie four out here and about i think six in prison you know, uh, you're saying how. Yeah, because Hollywood, it, you know, yeah. um, Hollywood fucking takes a Hollywood style privilege and adds shit to a story that's not really there. Yeah. You know, and, and, and some people that are in that world take offense to some of the liberties that, you know, Hollywood might take in telling a story like that. And they definitely did. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a real body count around that. Uh, Edward James almost had a hit on him oh, yeah. at one point. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that green light. Oh, yeah? I mean, you, it was you knew about it? Yeah, it was, all yeah. Talk, it's, it was talked about all through Los Angeles in, in terms of if you were connected to the street at all and you were a fan of dude, but you knew what was going on, you knew it wasn't safe for him for a minute yeah. to be walking on the street over, over some of the stuff. That, that, that they told in the movie, you yeah. know, just for the sake of embellishment and, and making it more dramatic and shit. Yeah. Well, you end up getting shot at 17. Yeah. What was that situation about? Oh, shit. You know, uh, we were uh, a, a group of, of homies from my set. We were hanging out with, with uh, homies from another set in their neighborhood. And... Um, you know, we were we were uh, we were hanging off Imperial, just uh, maybe west of of Hoover, where one of our OG homies lived. He had moved out of our neighborhood and moved towards these other homies' hood that we knew. So he was relatively safe right there. You know what I'm saying? So we you know we went to go party with him and shit like that. And <laughs> oddly enough, someone asked, "Hey, where where's the weed at?" And uh, this homie answered, "Oh man." I got, you know, I got some weed at my crib two blocks away. And we're like, all right, let's go get it. You know, because we didn't want him to walk, you know, through the hood by himself. I mean, because they that neighborhood shared a neighborhood with a rival neighborhood, right? So, you know, we get maybe, um, he, dude, li our homie lived maybe like 500 feet from the corner on Imperial to, to 
Hoover. And as we're walking there, you know, usually one of us got a strap on us. That day we got caught slipping. We didn't have the strap. We left it back at homie's fucking crib, which was literally 500 feet away, you know, but there was no way to get that with, with what happened. So as we're walking up on the corner, a car, you know, full of, uh, homies in blue hats, you know, it was cripping. They seen us, we're bleeding. And, you know, all the shit starts, you know, that all the shit talking starts. And before you know it, pull out, you know, the 22 starts capping. He hits one of my homies um, here. He turns right around, he runs away and he got hit here. But the way that he got hit made it look like maybe he got hit here and he was about to fall down. They've immediately turn the gun on me i'm running down the side of a wall here they take four shots at me the last one ricochets off the wall and bounces right into the side of my back punctures my lung and it was with a 22 hollow point so uh a piece shot above the heart a piece shot towards the spinal cord and a piece is over here somewhere so I got really fucking lucky, but it punctured my lung. So I fell out like after I hit the corner, like I was able to like take maybe five to 10 steps before one of my lungs collapsed. And my homies found me right there. They, they, they didn't know if I was gone or not, but they saw me there. They picked me up. They put me in Cadillac and rushed me to Killer King Hospital. I was, I was more in fear of being in Killer King than what actually happened to me. Because the rumors that of what happens to motherfuckers at Killer King Hospital, which is Martin Luther King Hospital in Linwood um, or Compton, whatever that, whatever city that's that was in, um, I believe it was Linwood. The stories that you would get there, like you'd go in for small shit and end up never coming out of there. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's what was on my mind more than anything. It wasn't necessarily that I got shot. I mean, I was tripping that I got shot for sure, but more than anything, I was like, where are you taking me? Are you taking me to Killer King? Fuck that. But they took me there. Unfortunately, you know, they were able to help me out. Um, but it was a trip because, you know, there was like fucking the emergency room was full, full of fucking gunshot wound um victims man i you know and i was the youngest in there i was like 16 17 years old and all these grown-ass men and some of them gangbangers and some of them not all in there for major gunshot wounds you know fortunately you know where the pieces ended up didn't affect anything other than you know the lung puncture and uh they you know they told me they didn't want to operate because there was a couple things that could happen, right? One, they'd have to open me up, which normally if you've been shot, right, in the upper torso anywhere, they're fucking splitting you down here to, to remove, you know, whatever they can get to. And fortunately for me, I don't have that scar. They didn't get into it because like where my shit was at, they said, well, you know, it's too close to the heart, the fragment, we could possibly induce a heart attack on you the other part is too close to your spine so if we try to get that we could paralyze you the other one is a non-factor so the two that they didn't want to they didn't want to touch you know could have possibly changed my whole fucking life so i just said you know my question was what happens if i leave them there i said well you'll have some discomfort but eventually tissue will grow around it and you'll be fine but I had to spend a week there getting my lung recovered, you know, like blowing into this fucking piece that they give you to re um, to to get your lung back to 100 percent capacity and whatnot. So I was there for a couple of weeks and man, the gang banging that would happen in the hospital hmm. was fucking nuts. So people would be fighting each other oh, in the hospital. Man, you'd see you'd see, you know, <laughs> other bloods That's and crazy. Crips. You know, they thought I was a Mexican bank banger. They didn't know I was like, you know, Damu in it. So, you know, when I'd be getting wheeled in, none of the Crips would come at me, but they'd see other dudes that they know that were for sure, that they knew for sure were bloods. And they'd be like fucking riding on each other right there in the hallway in their wheelchairs with their nurses pushing them to their next fucking <laughs> therapy thing. And then, you know, 
people coming to visit their homies, you know, like you got Bloods and Crips and Mexican gangbangers that are all up in that hospital and all their family and friends are coming. It was truly a, a, a fucking gangbang magnet, that hospital. I'm surprised like more shootouts and murders didn't happen in that fucking hospital waiting room or parking lot you know, than, than it did. Cause I mean, it was like a hub, like, you know, put it this way, right? That was the place that they sent you if you didn't have any insurance and no gangbangers have insurance. So they sent you there. And, uh, it, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was like a war zone. That hospital was not only like a place to, you know, try to fix people from what was happening in the LA war zones, but it was actually a fucking war zone itself. Okay, so you still have bullets, bullet fragments yeah. inside it? Yeah, yeah. Does it bother you at all or not really? When it gets really cold, I'll get like from the nerve damage, like mm. shit here, like the little stinging little needles. And then I got like, you know, a scar here from when I had to pop the tube into my lung to get the blood out of, out of my lung before they could re, you know, give me the therapy to recuperate the lung yeah yeah was that the only shooting oh no we i had been in many but that was the one that i got hit it's the only time you got hit yeah so you'd been in a bunch of shootings pretty much you know when when you choose that lifestyle shit's gonna happen you're either gonna be on you're gonna be on one end or the other of of that strap you know and and when you're fucking gang banging you end up on both sides of that. Hopefully, you know, if you're lucky enough, you don't get hit by the, by the opposing side. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but that's that's the life. I mean, how it is now, I you know, I really couldn't tell you because I'm not tapped in. But in in those those uh, in the mid '80s and early '90s, man, it was it was on and popping like that. You know, you couldn't turn your back on the street. Like if you were standing on your block, the the worst thing you could do is have your back turns to turn to the street because anytime someone could hit the corner and just come and let you have it and if you're not ready for it lights out did you ever find out who did it no i mean that it's tough because realistically there's so many gangs that surround one area i mean there was like maybe six five or six neighborhoods that share that stretch you know what I mean? So it would have been impossible unless they they were calling out their set, you know, when they were when when it all happened and no one did that. It was just fuck you, blood, fuck you, you know, fuck you this, fuck you that. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, all the shit that happens between <laughs> the opposing sides. You know what I'm saying? First, you know, the fucking set tripping, and then the fuck you, fuck you, and then the pop pop pop. You know, so it it nobody really identified what neighborhood they were from it was just we you know they knew we were bloods we knew they were crips they were strapped we weren't right and what's interesting is that you know later on once you started releasing music you weren't talking about bloods no i mean you were talking about gang banging right but you didn't specifically mention uh you know your set you didn't you didn't mention um well there was one time i, I did which was throw your set in the air, in the air giving up the family up and down central. Oh, okay. Right? And because that's where our family swan was. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but when central you can, and yeah. San Pedro, but it was never really overtly like, like you said. Right. Well, because I remember speaking, I forgot who I was speaking to. Was it, was it mob James where DJ quick was like the first person to really start claiming yeah. sets on, on a record. Yeah. NWA once again, gang banging, whatever, but you never heard Easy E say set. Kelly Park Crips right. or, or anything else like that. DJ Quick was the first one to actually say what yeah. blood set he's from. Was it a treetop? Treetop, yeah. And then later on, it just started to kind of, yeah. you know, MC8 started claiming his, and then, yeah. you know, more and more uh, hip hop groups. Now it's common, but back yeah, then. Yeah, it was uncommon back then. It was just all hush hush. Like, we're not trying to put all that out there. Yeah, for me, it was like, I made a choice, right? Just like I made a choice when I started banging. This was my choice. Okay, so I have to accept what happens with these choices. So like, obviously the trajectory is I could either end up in prison or dead, paralyzed, or just this shit lifelong. And, and this is what I'm gonna do, right? This is my choice. So whatever happens to me, I chose this. 
when I started fucking with music, I chose the music, right? And I said, you know what? I cannot bring none of this shit into the music because this is something different. This is something that's, you know, to me, like the fact that Send Dog and Mugs and Mellow came and got me to, to, to make music. They said, hey, listen, we know you're doing this shit over here, but why don't you try come writing songs? And at first I was like, nah, fuck that. You know, I'm right here. We, we're gonna make, we ain't gonna make no money rapping. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was totally like on some bullshit. You know, I was indoctrinated, I was washed. This is what I wanted to do. I couldn't see anything else. But somehow they convinced me. They're like, well, what do you got to lose? Just come fucking write a song. And if you know, if you don't like it, fuck it, you come back here. And uh, so I said, all right, fuck it. I, and so I wrote a couple songs for Mello's first album and it let me know that I could still do it because before I got into gangbanging, we was into hip hop, we was, you know, on some rap shit, on some b-boy shit. Mm -hmm. But I let all that go when I got into the gangbanging and, and fucking um, when these dudes brought it back to me, I got bit by that, that bug of creativity and writing. I thought, so fuck, I could still do this whole up. And... I was kind of, you know, straggling between banging and, 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 and making music. And then eventually when we made our first demo, that's when I chose, I was like, you know what? I cannot bring this shit into this one. Cause I don't want to fuck up the opportunity that these dudes brought to me. I don't want to fuck up their opportunity because they saw fit to come pull me out and give me a shot. And I don't want to fuck their chance up. So. I'm gonna leave this shit over here and I'm gonna put my time, energy and focus in here. And, you know, it was a simple conversation I had with, with my homies, you know, because within a gang, you know, you have clicks within the click. Because if you got a gang of 200 people, not everybody is close and not everybody's clickish together. You know, everybody has their, their own group within that set. And I told my homies like, hey, this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna go do this shit. And they're like, we got you, handle that shit. Don't worry about this shit over here, fuck this. We, you know, it's gonna be here. You don't need to be around for this shit, go do that. And they always had my back with that shit. And yeah, you know, I would imagine that there's some motherfuckers who's like, oh man, so yeah, leave the hood and shit like that. But hey, listen, you know, if you got a talent and you got an opportunity, you best jump on that shit. You know, I was, I, I had homies, a support system that one, they came and got me Two, they, they made me feel like as though I could do it. Like, Hey, listen, this is what you should be doing as opposed to just, you know, fuck it, do what you're going to do. Let yourself go waste away. I had homies that gave a fuck. So that, that was, that helped me push through to leave that, that life behind and, and focus on the music. You know, and I would make reference to some of the shit, you know, in 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 in, in relation to my set and in in like in terms of claiming it, but yeah. I didn't overtly like glorify it. Yeah. You weren't in red rags on your covers nah, and stuff man. like that. Yeah, nah, because I wasn't trying to fuel a fire, if you will. I was trying to show that there is a way out of that shit. Right. Well. You're friends with Send Dog, and his brother is Mellow Man Ace. Right. And I don't think people realize how big the song Mentirosa was. Huge. It's huge. Opened up many doors. Huge. I remember I was living in the Bay, and that was like the biggest record in the oh, Bay. Yeah. He hit a lick with that one. Oh, man. he did. Well, his biggest song ever. Yeah. To this day. True that. And uh, uh, Tony G produced it. Mm -hmm. Julio G was his DJ, who later, you know, became our DJ. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, man. I mean, he had it all clicking right there because he what he did was he brought that Spanglish style out there that nobody was, you know, fucking with. I mean, Kid Frost too. Th them two were sort yeah. of the two guys, you know, that 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 popped that style off. Um, one in the street form and one in the, you know, like the party the smooth, the smooth, yeah. smooth homie party form, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, they both pioneered that shit, you know, and they opened it up opened up the doors for cats with with getting in with that particular style right so so here you are your friends with send dog and his brother is now blowing up as mellow man ace 
And Muggs was in the group 783. Yeah. He was the DJ slash producer. Yeah. And they had uh, Coolin and Cali. Coolin and Cali, yeah. Which, which was a moderate success. And then they did Colors for the movie Colors. Oh, okay. Or It's a Mad World. It's a mad world. It's uh, yeah. a mad, mad world. They did the a sound. Colors was an ice tea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Colors the actual was ice tea. But yeah. I'm saying on the movie on, Colors, on the movie. they did a song called Mad, Mad World on that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So now two of the people around you have are connected to success in the music industry. Right. You know, major label. Back then, there really were not, you know, independent labels like that. It was. Yeah, there was a few. There was a few, but these guys were now, were now on majors. So. You guys form a group, and originally it was called DVX. Right. Devastating Vocal Excellence. Yeah. We decided to leave that E out. <laughs> I'm sure it was really fresh at that day. It was. When you look back and look at it and now. You're like, <laughs> It's like, ah. I didn't make the name up, though. It, it, it existed before I came into the crew. Right. Uh, but what, what's a trip was um, before 73 and... and um, even before Melo hit his lick, you know, we were all hanging together before that. Like Muggs was part of our crew. And, you know, we were all just working on demos, trying to figure it out. And I believe Muggs, Muggs met Brett B and, and uh, his brother Sean through another homie that we had, through a mutual homie. And they, you know, they made a connection being that they were both from the East Coast. They, they, they caught a vibe. And when that, when that, all that was happening, that's when I sort of kind of, you know, slipped out the back door and, and started banging and shit like that. And they stood hard in the paint in terms of, of music. So as, you know, Muggs gets put on with 783, he starts working with Mello on, on some of his demos and, and, and sort of uh, was formulating Mello's first shit that would go out on Delicious Vinyl before he got on the Capitol. So, you know, we were all working together, but I was kind of out of the loop until, you know, until Mello really, you know, got his deal going. And that's when they asked me to come back and, and start trying to write for him. But we were all a crew before any of that shit happened. So, you know, Muggs, I think, always recognized that I was a pretty decent writer. And if I was around the right people, I could learn to be a really good writer. So he would, you know, have me hanging out with Brett, who brett taught me how to write a song as opposed to a rap you know so i learned a lot from that shit but you know it, it was like um things needed to go that way i think as opposed to us trying to you know go for and make these demos the way we were making them before this shit happened because we didn't know what the fuck we were doing um but when mugs got with them you know he got around other people and he learned the, the 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 process of how you fucking create a song from scratch, how you produce a song and all that shit. And uh, you know, that those were the those were the things that sort of carved shit out for us later because he learned all those things and then brought them to the table when he decided to to connect Sen and I back together as a group. Because before we were sort of just backing up mellow, Sen and I. And then I got I got put off and then I, you know, I went, I went back into the, the shit I was doing and Send Dog became Mello's hype man for a time. You know what I mean? So everybody was functioning and I was like pretty much the last one in the loop, man. I mean, it took me a second to, to catch up to where they were at. Writing, I was there, but in terms of performing and having a voice that motherfuckers would fuck with. Yeah, it, it took me a minute, but yeah, man, it, it was uh, in those early times. And even, even after 783, you know, Muggs was like constantly around, um, you know, like cats that were related to uh, Rhyme Syndicate. I mean, we were always hanging out with Rhyme Syndicate cats, man. Yeah. They, they were like our mentors yeah. and shit like that. And, Everlast was in that group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, it, those were fun fucking times. They were big learning experiences because some of the guys that, that we were hanging out with were dudes that we looked up to like, and you know, we're like, fuck, we want to do what they're fucking doing. So we just sort of paid attention. The do's and don'ts, if you will. Well, you know, Cypress Hill these days is a household name, but this was not a typical rap group name. I mean, DVX was more of a, 
a common type oh, of name yeah. for, yeah, that for that sure. era, that Cypress time, yeah. Hill. S- so when you first heard it, were you like, oh yeah, this is the name or like Cypress Hill? Like this doesn't even. Well, see, this is what, th- this is what confused people. So we, um, Send Dog lived on Cypress Avenue in Southgate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Muggs was our only connection to East Coast music, East Coast hip hop, really, and K-Day. Whatever K-Day would push, you know, through the mix masters, we'd hear that. But Muggs, being from the East Coast, he'd go back and forth and he'd bring us back these fucking jewels, right? And he brings us back this fucking record, um, the Wild Style record with Ram LZ. And he was talking about in one of the rhymes, uh, shot up town to Cypress Hill, broke into a deaf a, a, a deaf Seville or some shit like this. We're like Cypress Hill, Cypress Cypress Ave, Cypress Hill. Fuck, let's call ourselves Cypress Hill. And it was from that. And he was one of the dudes that influenced me in terms of pitching my voice. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because my rap voice at the time was more like my talking voice, and it just didn't cut through. It it was whack. And, you know, me and Melo were big fans of Ram LZ because this motherfucker would pitch his voice high or low and in the middle. And we thought, man, that shit is crazy. And especially bugging out when he'd, he, he'd, he'd throw that high pitch um, tone in, in the middle of one of his raps. And, and, you know, we started fucking around, Melo and I just experimenting with that shit. And that eventually you know, birthed my style, which was the high nasal style that right. people became accustomed to. But it was that, it was, it was that artist and a song on the Wild Style album, which was obviously a, one of the first hip hop documentaries, Wild Style. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you could consider it a documentary more than a movie, but that that dude influenced us to change our name from DVX to Cypress Hill. Right. There's also Ad Rock who had the high pitch. Oh yeah, Ad, Ad Rock and and um, from the Beastie Boys and uh, and uh, Mike D. Yeah. But before them, it, it was Ram LZ. Yeah. Okay, so you guys put together this demo, and you get signed to Rough House. Right. And at the time, was it Fuji's was on Rough House? No, they weren't on there yet. They came after okay. us. Okay. Were you guys the first group on Rough House? Or? Uh, I, I think. Who was it? I'm looking. Uh, Schoolie D was on there at it one was, point. It, it was Schoolie D who was first, and and then uh, Criss Cross. No, Criss Cross came, came after us. Um, fuck, we it, uh, we were one of the first two. It could have been the Goats that was after us. I think the Goats were after you. Yeah. And then Fuji's came after you guys. And then they had, I remember they had homie that was the Pied Piper for a small time. <laughs> that guy. They were this close to signing DMX, from what I hear. Mm. You know, um, they dropped the ball on that. I that that's a ball you, drop right who there. Who the hell does not <laughs> sign my man right there? You know, that was that Def Jam got him though. Oh yeah, right. But I believe Rough Rough House had a chance to get him, and they they passed on him. I could not believe that. But they passed on House of Pain too, which I could not believe. Yeah, you know. But it, you know, it is what it is. It, you know, people are meant to end up where they end up, because who knows if they blow up in that scenario with with rough house you know well you guys dropped your debut album it was self-titled and you had the logo with the skull with the weed plant on it and you know these days everyone in hip-hop smokes weed and weed is legal most places and so forth but at that time no rappers were really talking about weed to that extent in fact NWA had a song called Express Yourself. Right. And Dr. Dre said, I don't smoke weed or cess because that's known to give a brother brain damage and brain damage Dude. on the mic don't manage nothing but making a sucker new equal. <laughs> <laughs> don't be a sequel. <laughs> right. Weed was considered kind of like, and I remember me being in high school around that time, the loser kids were considered the stoners. It, there was nothing cool about smoking weed. It yeah, was, it was kind of boo. It was a taboo. It was considered sort of like, okay, you're on your way out. You're a burnout. You're a burnout. You're a loser, you know, and so forth. So it wasn't something that I was looking up to. But then that's this first album comes out, and it was just so dope. And there was just weed references all throughout. I started smoking weed around that time. I was going to UC <laughs> Berkeley. Right. And we were bumping Cypress Hill, and we were smoking weed. And, you know, to this day, I still smoke weed every day. <laughs> I yeah. blame you for this. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you know, for, for us, it, it, we were just being ourselves, really talking about the things that, that we felt were important. We were talking about shit that we were doing. You know, it was very much us. We didn't realize the impact that it would have in terms of um, being spokes um, men for, for, for the cannabis movement or the legalization movement. That wasn't even something that we thought about. Um, we didn't think that normal or high times or, or any of, of um, these existing cannabis platforms would, would come to us and embrace us. Because I mean, you know, at the, you know, at the end of the day, we're a hip hop group and hip hop was the stepchild in, <laughs> at the time of all music genres, you know, was, was not getting the respect that it should have. And it was a young genre still, even though we were considered maybe third generation hip hop artists at that time, it was still very new. And the fact that we were coming out talking about cannabis and then not necessarily being a gangster rap group, but talking, you know, gangster shit within the context of our music. Um, you know, we didn't, we had no fucking clue that, that, um, that they would embrace us like that and embrace that particular message. Now, kids that were listening to hip hop, a lot of them were smoking weed and so were the artists, but because it was taboo and, you know, there definitely wasn't going to be anybody playing your records that, <laughs> right. you know, making references to, to, to cannabis at that time, no one dared to talk about it because, you know, could you get a fucking record deal talking about this shit, right? No. Realistically, we, we were lucky enough that we had Joe and Chris from Rough House that believed in what we were doing just beyond the cannabis shit. They looked at the music as a whole, which, which helped get us through the door. But once we got through that door, the messages that were received by people that, that loved cannabis and that wanted legalization, here we are talking all the shit no one else will talk in 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 music at that time aside from you know what bob marley and peter tosh and, and the reggae artists that were championing legalization you know here we are a new hip-hop group coming out swinging hard on it yeah and um fortunately you know it i think we made it okay to talk about you know, because we, we did it unapologetically and, you know, we kept evolving and elevating and educating people and, and creating the awareness for cannabis legalization. And we didn't care what it was going to do to us because, you know, we felt strongly about it after we realized, like, we have this platform to say something for those people, for the people like us who think it should be legal. Fuck it. You know, this is not what all our music is about, but we will speak to it, you know, being that now they're, they're embracing us and they're asking us to speak on their behalf. So, um, it, it, it's a, tr it was a trip going from one group, um, talking about it and then dealing with all the, the fucking slings and arrows that come with that. Right. To now, you know, you had other artists and other groups talking about it, which made a bigger splash. So we never got, um, we never got like that 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 feeling like what the fuck are y'all coming in our lane for? Y'all need to stay in your lane. Fuck no. We were like the more people that come into yeah. this lane is going to get us to that finish line we're looking at a lot faster. So we embraced everybody that was started talking about cannabis, even if they didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. <laughs> you know, yes, talk about it. But as as anything, man, you know, motherfuckers oversaturate. You know, just like when. 50 came in the game and he, he took those shots and some people felt like that validated his career. That didn't validate his career. He's a fucking dope artist. You know what I'm saying? The motherfucker makes dope songs. Yeah, that adds to his whole story. And the fact that he survived that adds to his story, but he's a dope artist. But motherfuckers started thinking, oh man, I need to you know get involved with some bullshit to get validated. And it, it, it was the same thing for cannabis for a minute. Like, oh, I, I, you know what? If I'm gonna be a hip hop artist, I gotta have a song about weed. And so you got, you know, so you got the positive and negative about it. You know, you got people talking about it and now it's, the, it's a little bit more normalized, but you know, you got un uneducated motherfuckers just trying to make money off, you know, yeah. a, a weed song. And that's cool, but 
those are the positive and negatives of it. You're going to have people that are sincere that really want to see things happen for real and, and be a part of that process. And then others that just want to cash in and capitalize off of the fucking bullshit, you know? Well, this was such a incredible album. I mean, this was to me like a life-changing album because it was so different than anything else that I'd ever heard. I'd been a yeah. hip hop head really since the beginning, Yeah, you know, from, you know, the message and, and the Run DMC's first album and, and so forth. And this thing, like the production on it, mugs really just went oh, yeah. all out. It's really kind of interesting now because I just interviewed uh, Chuck D from yeah. Public Enemy. When I listened to like the Bomb Squad production, oh, when yeah. I listened to what you know you guys did on this first album, I I, I now see the similarities yeah. in terms of, like the noises and the right. kind of the off pitch and the yeah the, you know, the weird kind of sound effects that they, that kind of work. When yeah. you put it all together they were one of our biggest influences like i mean i could say that about our group period you know from mugs to send dog myself bobo we were all very much influenced by by public enemy that, probably the most influential hip-hop group to us aside from run dmc you know um and that was because they were out of the box in terms of their style their content their flow their production their production was was innovative and cutting edge and ahead of its time they you know they they put breaks hooks bridges um all these ill ass sounds that was chaos and harmony mixed in one and we loved that shit. and so you know when mugs came into his own in producing which you know a lot of people don't give him enough credit the motherfucker is a genius i agree um he was able to be influenced by that but not copy it he developed his own form of that that harmonious chaos with bridges and breaks and shit that made the song come up and then drop and then come up like a roller coaster yeah and we were very much in tuned in that style mugs and i you know what i mean because we liked the same shit like from the darkest hip hop to the grittiest to, you know, the most out of the box shit. We were always on that same page. So we I always looked at us like a flip side of Public Enemy, but with different things, obviously, that we talk about. You're the high pitch guy, and Send Dog is the low pitch right. guy. We're pretty the much. The reverse of, of you yeah, know, Flavor reverse, Flav and Chuck D. Right. A reversal in, in terms yeah. of our vocal tone and uh, a dusted out trippy version of the production yeah if you will you know what i'm saying and and uh yeah i mean w we learned a lot from just listening and watching them and and uh yeah i mean i i think if it wasn't for them i i don't know if there's us because i mean we crafted our shit to be as different as as theirs like you know we were like we thought of them as something so out of the box that we needed to be out of the box too we didn't want to be like especially coming out of California. If you came out of, of, of Southern California, you were expected to sound like NWA, you know, a version of that. Or Some, Kid Frost. Yes, or, or Kid Frost, if yeah. you're fucking Latin. Exactly. And we did not want to be in that box. Yeah, because you guys didn't come out as quote unquote Latin rappers. No. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember even, like I remember I interviewed Mr. Criminal and he was talking about Latin hip hop groups. And he said, well, you know, he's, he said, he's a big fan of Cypress Hill, but he's like, but they came out more like on the black side, meaning kind of like more traditional hip hop. Right. Well, first of all, I don't consider Cypress Hill Chicano rap realistically. I mean, I know they're brown skin, but you know, they say like nigga in their raps and they, they represent themselves a little more hip hop-y and more, a little bit more like urban, like, like, okay. like, like black side. I'll give you that. You know, the, the corn rolls, the whole nine, like we don't rock like that. So uh, I think that that helped play into their success as well because they weren't in a box, you know what I'm saying? It's just like Chicano rap or just like that mm -hmm. cholo image, you know what I'm saying? Whereas, you know, what he was doing was true. more like on the Mexican side. And, that, and that's true. It's, it's true. It's yeah. very truthful. Um, we wanted to just be looked at as a hip hop group and not a Latino hip hop group because yeah. at the time we came out. It was, was Lighter Shade of Brown out during no, that time? No. They came later. No, Kid Frost and Melo were probably the only Latinos out at at the time that were slightly before us. Yeah. Right? Um, maybe 
two a year or two before us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mellow, I think, came out in eighty eight or eighty seven or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so like there there wasn't too many other Latinos um around. Maybe Fat Joe. Maybe Fat Joe, but like his shit was hip hop, right? And and no one no one talked about the fact that it was, you know, it was Latin hip hop. It was just hip hop. Yeah. Well, I, and, I actually looked it up. Lighter Shade of Brown, their first album, Brown and Proud, came out in 1990. Oh, okay. So shit, they were before us. That's yeah. crazy. Just, just slightly. I don't know yeah. if that. Yeah. Yeah. And this, yeah, we're and this, this album, this album charted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I wasn't really paying attention to them, unfortunately. Rent, rest in peace to the homie, you know. Um, yeah. We, we had little beefs with them at times. But um, yeah, I mean, for, for us, we didn't want to be foothold in this Latino hip hop yeah. thing that hadn't existed yet. Right. So in other words, there were those of us like Lighter Shade of Brown, like Kid Frost, like Mellow Man and ourselves and eventually Joe and Pond and the rest. At the time we were doing it, there was not a Latin, um, a Latin audience for hip hop. There was kids in the hood that were Latino that fucked with hip hop. But in terms of like a Latin base, like if you were labeled as Latin hip hop, people that just fucked with hip hop, they weren't buying that. Yeah, it was only to the Mexican crowds. Yeah, and the Mexican <laughs> crowds, the low rider shows, and, and they everything. weren't buying that yet. Yeah, they were buying like that crowd, oldies. <laughs> yeah, they were buying oldies and funk and shit like that. Yeah. You know that hip hip hop wasn't a thing to them yet, and you know like it was growing in that community because of Frost and because of of Mellow, but it wasn't there yet, and we knew that, so it was like. We didn't want to allow ourselves to be boxed in by a label as a Latino hip hop group. We were like, we know we're Latin. We know what we are and we're proud of what we are, but we're not going to exploit that to create this new, new fucking box. We want to just be a hip hop group. You know what I mean? And we'll show people what we are, what we are and who we are through our music. And if you listen to every fucking Cypress Hill album, there's always a Latin flavor joint out there. When, yeah. First time I had Latin lingo. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, there was Latin lingo and there was Tres Equis, right? Tres Equis, yeah. One which is Spanglish and one which is, which is total Spanish. And we continued that theme later on. And then we eventually make an, a, an EP or a... Yeah, EP or album remake in, in Exitos Grandes where it's all Spanish speaking. And, you know, but we wanted to build that. We didn't want to that that to be the main focus on us because we wouldn't have sold any records. You know what I mean? Right. And and uh it worked to our you know. Yeah. It it I I don't know if Sony saw what, what we were trying to say in that, but they but they rode with us. And they realized, okay, yeah, let's 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 go this route. These guys are talking about. Let's let's let it happen organically. And as the Latino community opened up to hip hop, you know, it, it became a bigger thing. And you saw many groups come out and then blow the fuck up after that. Yeah. And and uh, the talent that would come out, you know, and 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 the the like the the actual hip hop. Lay, or the 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 companies that were investing in the hip hop artists, they now saw that there are some Latinos out there that can fucking get down with this with this genre and be something and fucking make a, a huge run. And uh, you know, it, it took a minute for them to see that. I mean, even so, they let us they let us in little by little. <laughs> you know, you there's more Latin artists now, but at that time, it was like little by little because yeah. you know they didn't know how to sell us and and for you know fortunately for us we stood we stuck with our guns and said you're gonna let, market us as a hip-hop group not a latin hip-hop group and you know that helped get us out there now these days there's there's a, a base for latin hip-hop and 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 the the reggaeton <laughs> lane and and all that stuff and all the new shit that spawned from that now there is definitely a lane so you can get a latino rap group or a artist and market him towards that shit and he's going to do great but back then that didn't exist yeah it was just hip hop and we didn't want to be in the void right and such a such a brilliant album man uh hole in the head is my favorite song yeah that's one of my favorites too that's the beat on that and the way you spit on that is just something something else and 
for example, uh, you know, Hand on the Pump, the way you guys uh, sampled Duke of Earl, <laughs> which was like the, yeah. <laughs> the most poppy like fun song ever you guys turned into a gangster song like, yeah about shooting Mug, people. Hey, Muggs, hey, Muggs is a genius i gotta he tell is, you man. He, he knows is. how to create that ominous dark you know um anxiety driven music i mean let me tell you i was so influenced by that by that album and your group that you know years later when i became a full-time dj as dj vlad my one of my aliases was Vlad the Butcher. I remember that. Which which is I got a, one of those. You got, I got one of those. Like five of those, dude. Dope, <laughs> dope, yeah. dope. Yeah, which which is a play off uh, Joe Niccolo. Yeah, aka the Butcher. Yeah, you know, I I kind of partly based it off that and the gangs in New York. I found that CD two days ago. I was going really? through all my old shit. <laughs> I said, "Oh shit, I should bring." I totally forgot to bring it. Uh, yeah, man, such a such a incredible incredible album once again it, who, who's ever listening to this right now if you haven't heard of that album go pull it up on spotify right now and, and what's smoke crazy, a blunt and and just zone out to this you, you and, will not be disappointed and what's crazy is that mugs made that whole thing off of sp 1200 oh that's that dirty gritty yeah, sound all that yeah. sh- and, but think with about what, it. like 10 seconds of sample time yeah, or with something 10 seconds of sample time he <laughs> created all that shit on that first album and 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 most of the second album too I don't think he started fucking with the ASR and MPC till after the third mm. album or something like that. But mo- the first two, I believe, were straight up SB 1200s. Okay. So this album comes out and it goes platinum? Not not right away. It, it took a minute, you know, because, you know, our first single, well, we had a double A side for the first single, which was Funky Phil Ones and... and uh, and kill a man and to be safe sony wanted to put out funky phil one first but someone suggested making it a double a side to give djs the option to flip it if they if they wanted to because they they loved kill a man but they weren't sure if if it was going to get played yeah, not of, exactly a radio single it's not a radio <laughs> single right <laughs> about killing a man right um <laughs> so funky phil one comes out and it's Doing decent. Yeah, not, not my favorite Cypress Hill song, yeah. I'll be honest. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you, like, out of all the Cypress Hill songs, you know, that's, it's a cool song, but it's not one of the strongest. It's not Killer Man. But it was, it was safe for Sony. To, I, I can see. It's a, it's a radio type single. Yeah, yeah, it was safe. But it wasn't getting that kind of traction. You know, people fucked with it, but it just, it, it, it wasn't getting that kind of traction. And, and we were on tour while this while they were putting this shit out and we did the video for it people thought it was we were on the east coast but we weren't we were downtown la you know and making it seem as though we were on the east coast because it was like on some alley cat type shit right um but you know we get on this tour with naughty by nature who you know they were they're our boys man they constantly looking out for us and you know they they uh had us come opening up for them while they had the number one song in in the nation at the time with OPP and uh people started you know DJ started flipping over to to kill a man and we start getting traction on the mix show play right you know motherfuckers are playing kill a man left and right on the mix shows and Sony says to us we need you guys to come off a tour for for a few days to come film a video for kill a man it's getting traction and we end up filming two videos one in Red Hook which was hand on the pump, and then we eventually filmed Killing Man throughout different boroughs in New York. That's why you know you see us in Harlem, you see us, I believe, in Brooklyn, you see us over there in um, on Forty Second Street, and in a couple of other places. We were all over New York for that one. Uh, Sh- David Shady Perez uh, was the one who directed uh, Killing Man, and he had us going all over the fucking place, but. Um, you know, and then we get the cameos from, you know, uh, UMCs, Q-Tip, Ice Cube, and Tim Dog. You know, that was all organic. None of that shit was planned. So, you know, this song's starting to bubble. It's starting to go. And then um, Chuck D and the Bomb Squad hear the song, and they want to use it for Juice. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, the, Chuck the, D actually talked about that yeah, in our and, interview. 
and it worked the other way. We we and then you know Sony had that void. Who do you think they filled that void with? With Def Jam left, Rough House. Mm, okay, yeah, with Fuji's and Cypress Hill, and yeah, it's the way the ball bounces sometimes. We didn't know that that was Chuck. Yeah, making that call for us. Yeah. We had no fucking clue. I right. didn't know yeah. till. And I was already a fan of that song. Yeah. So when I heard it in Juice, I'm like, oh, Cypress Hill. That propelled the song. So like we're getting more traction now and more spins and more plays and people starting to talk about Cypress Hill. And then, um, you know, eventually now the video hits and motherfuckers are fucking with it. And then Juice hits and that shit propels it like in, in such a way that none of us you know, were prepared for or or even dreamed of happening. We did not know that that that, that movie was gonna fucking blow that fucking song way the fuck up. I mean it was it was already going, you know, but that that movie actually fucking just helped it propel to to a degree that we just did not see happening and and things started to change from there and they started talking about us and now yeah. We're getting shows and, you know, our shows are off the hook. It, but it was a trip how it turned around once they flipped to from from Funky Phil one to uh, to Kill a Man. It was a totally different flip. We started off on the 200 charts, right? I believe we were at 170 when we came in. We dropped off for like three, four weeks. And then when Kill a Man popped off, it fucking rose back up. And it started like steadily rising back up for the whole year, for about a year and a half. And and uh, when by the time we released Black Sunday, it popped all the way up to number five, the album. And right, because I mean that first album goes double platinum. Yeah, eventually. Eventually. Yeah, and I guess Ice Cube showed up in that first in video, the Killer Man video, the Killer yeah. Man video, and you guys became friends. Yeah, you know he, the the thing that. Uh, that was always coming around to me from other cats that that we would uh eventually meet like Buster Rhymes one my, my homie and we were really close back in those early days and he would always tell me how um EP the, the homies from EPMD are the ones who put him on to Cypress Hill and Ice Cube told me the same story that EPMD told him about us and then Ice Cube would tell other people about us and we were being talked about it, you know, amongst people that we fucking respected and we absolutely wanted to get down with. And, uh, you know, so we knew that Ice Cube had been like talking about us to people like, yo, man, these are the, these are the new motherfuckers right here and, and EPMD as well. Um, when we were filming the video, someone calls us that was friends with somebody that worked with Cube or something. He said, hey man, Ice Cube's in town. He heard you're doing the video. He wants to come down or some shit like that. So the story goes. Everybody tells a different story, but who knows <laughs> what the real one was. But he shows up and we're like, oh shit, Cube showed up to our video. That was huge to us. We were Because, you know, hey, it's fucking Ice Cube, you know? Right. This is after he left NWA. This is after he, he had left already NWA. dropped America's Most Wanted, yes. which was his best yeah, album he was ever. The, you know, he was on fire. He was on fire. He was one of the titans at the time. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we were like, it, it it was like, wow, this this dude came out to represent us. It, that was it meant a lot to me. It was a big cosign. After, yeah. Yeah. And then after that, you know, we became pretty good friends. You know, and 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 not to downplay any of that shit, but Q tip too. Hmm. He fucking would just happen to be walking <laughs> down the street, saw what was up, and he got down with us and and we became friends after that too, man. I mean, you know, we 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 hung out many times during like the Jack the Rappers and and new music seminars and shit like that. Yeah. We very much click up together like that not necessarily ice cube but but q-tip and, yeah. and some of some of that crew but um yeah i mean cube and i became friends we were hanging out here i you know um he was a big influence to me i always said it, you know the guys that i looked at to study that i had to be as good as he was one of them you know like i i looked to the certain people that i can propel myself to that level you know i i want to 
I want to get to to that level right there. So I got to, you know, study the 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 style, study the pocket, study the content, and then figure out where I'm at in all that. You know what I mean? So he was always one I looked up to, you know, like as as one of those guys for inspiration, like, you know, how you captivate motherfuckers, you know, in, in how you're saying it, the, the style you're spitting. And he was one of the masters. He still is. You get him on the right shit, man. This hmm. motherfucker goes off. Well, I guess you guys were hanging out one day. And this was while he was still beefing with NWA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you guys run into Easy e Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah what that happened? crazy. Uh, you know, I thought shit was going to happen. You know, right. you, I, were, you were strapped at the time. Oh, yeah. I, I was like a cowboy back then. You know, <laughs> I, I, I had a strap on me everywhere. Um, and Cube knew that, you know, like when I went to hang out with him that day, you know, we gave each other the bro, the bro hug and shit. He's like, you got a vest on, dude? Oh, you had a bulletproof vest Hell and guns yeah. on. Yeah, it was oh, real see. in the field for me back then, man, okay. you know? Um, <laughs> I was madcap. I, I, I was still, you know, I, I was not banging, but I was very cautious to know that, you know, dudes that, that were on the other side might have been like very hateful at, at you know, me being successful. Mm -hmm. So as a, a paranoid ex-gangbanger, you know, I was always strapped up, boom, had my vest on, sidearm at all times. I didn't give a fuck. And when I went to hang out with Cube, he didn't have any of his bodyguards hanging out when we would hang out. So, you know, shit, I took over the duty. If somebody was going to step to my dude, pfft, they were going to have to deal with it. He, maybe he didn't even know that, but he knew that I was always strapped and in, in that I had, that I was always ready. But that day we go, and I can't remember what album is out at this time. I think it's Lethal Injection or something like that. And I went over to Priority with him. And he was introducing me to some of the staff at Priority. And Ben Baller was there. I salute to my man, Ben Baller, because <laughs> we had went back, you know, we go back before he was with Priority. And, uh, you know, so I saw him, I greeted him, gave him the bro, bro greet. And, uh, you know, we were just hanging out. And, you know, I was talking with some of the staff. You know, they were asking me Cypress Hill questions. When's the next shit and all this other stuff. And uh, so he's there to just pick up you know, promo copies of the album and, you know, to give me one. And I'm just hanging out with him, right? And we come down to the fucking parking garage. And as we're rolling to his car, Easy's rolling up. And I, and, and I notice him right away. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, I'm thinking it's about to pop off and I'm about to be right here. Easy having some own bodyguards with him? or He was by himself. By himself. Okay. He was by himself. Well, he wasn't by himself. He had me. Yeah. And Easy was like, solo he, he didn't need to, to roll around with bodyguards if he didn't want to he had respect both of them did you know what i mean um but at that moment i thought oh shit i'm about to see a fair one jump off right <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought the fair one was about to happen because i you know i wasn't gonna jump in that that's that's between them that's between them if yeah. anything i'll break it the fuck up but Realistically, I thought the fair one was about to happen, but they handled their shit like gentlemen. They 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 said what's up to each other, shook each other's hand that fast, that quick, and then mm. you know, and and it was kind of quiet for a second because I didn't want you know I didn't want to say like hey what happened there <laughs> because you know they had been boys and you know they're gonna handle it how they're gonna handle it and it ain't my fucking business to 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 exacerbate shit or instigate and be like, oh, you just going to let that dude ride? <laughs> well, because violence had already broken out yeah. between Ruthless and, and Cube's thing. Like, I remember, uh, was it Cold 187 of them? Yeah. Told, told me about some brawl that happened. Oh, yeah. Uh, they and, had a lot of crazy times, those yeah. dudes, you know? And for me, you know, I was a fan of NWA. I was a fan of both. And, you know, as, as much as it... Uh, it, it was painful to see that happen to them because, you know, they were an L.A. group. They were Southern Cali. They were representing. And, and to see that happen, it was it was sad for a lot of us. You know, me as a fan of, of NWO, sad to see that. But I was glad for my homie that he was making his own way and popping it off. And 
these dudes, in spite of the beef, are still NWA and oh, they're yeah. still cracking it off. So I had respect, mad respect for both of them. Um, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a trip being in the middle of that. You know, because <laughs> really, I was really <laughs> friends with Cube, and you know, <laughs> it, it was just a. It was a weird situation to be right there in the middle yeah. of them, but I'm glad they didn't scrap it out because I think that would have made it worse. And you know, yeah, and they eventually, you know, got together and talked and became yeah. cool. And, and I thought that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. and then Easy died uh, yeah, of they, AIDS. I, I thought that was that was great that they were able to push all that shit aside before my man passed away and and reconnect as as brothers, not just friends, but brothers. I mean, they they had been through a lot and. Uh, you know, as as it happens in this business, people get in the way, you know, and sometimes your your own self could get in the way of friendship and shit like that. You know, if you're not if you don't have your eye on the ball and you're not paying attention to everything, certain shit slips and or you may. You know, you may overlook something that is important to someone else and then that creates the fucking tension but i mean we all know the story with them and how that happened so you know it's but it happens in this business man groups that start off together you know they don't always end up together well after you guys release your first album house of pain drops yeah. their album and now they're part of the whole soul you know assassins. soul assassins yeah. you know this this whole kind of umbrella organization yeah. that you guys form and House of Pain is part of this group. And like you said, Everlast was part of IC's crew. Yeah. Rhyme Syndicate. But now they came out with these white Irish rappers yeah. with like an Irish flag on their album cover. And I guess Jump Around was originally supposed to be a Cypress Hill song. Well, you know, it it, it bounced around in the click. You know, I think it it even, I thought it came to me first, but I hear that it went to Sun Doobie first. And son, you know, God bless him, but sometimes his work ethic was fucked up, <laughs> you know? And he knows I could say that because I could tell you that, son. <laughs> That's my boy. I love him to death. But yeah, sometimes he would sit on a beat and Muggs would not stand for that shit. If you ain't like getting busy, he'll pull that shit. So, you know, it might have went to son first. Um but that's unclear. I always thought he came to me first and then maybe Sun. Right. Well, I guess Sendog said that it came to him, but he said he couldn't write to it. Well, it, it came to me. <laughs> it came to me and I had it for maybe two, three weeks or something like that. And usually when it comes to me, it's coming to me and Sen. It's yeah. not just coming for me because it's for Cypress Hill. So him and I would, would fuck with it. Sometimes he would leave it to me to spark the idea. I could not come up for some reason. I just could not come up with anything for it. Like it, it, it would be easy for me to come up with a rhyme for it, but the chorus was not coming to me. And at that time, the most important thing was to write the chorus for first in, you know, the way we were getting down back then so that we can make the song around the chorus as opposed to vice versa. Right. So I could not come up with shit to it. And Everlast and I had developed a friendship at that point, man, you know, because at first, you know, um, we didn't know what to think of each other. We were introduced through mugs, you know, through some mutual people they were hanging out with. And, but immediately we clicked, you know, like it, it was it was one of those things, man. We became brothers like that. And, you know, getting to know him and getting talk, getting to talk to him, I could, he was telling me how he was like getting ready to not even fucking rap anymore. Right, because he had an album that yeah. came out that really didn't do anything. Yeah, and he was like ready to fucking quit yeah. hip hop and, you know, get on his guitar. What he would eventually do later, mm -hmm. um, he was ready to do that shit. And he said, you know, when I heard your guys' shit, it drove me back. Mm. And, you know, him telling me that, like it, it just connected us off the top. So when I couldn't come up with shit, I already knew Muggs was was trying to do something with them. And he, you know, he would ask for my input on certain things. So when I couldn't come up with shit to this beat, I said, hey, why don't you give it to, you know, why don't you give it to Everlast? I think he'll fucking slap this one. Yeah. And fortunately he listened to me and, you know, Everlast fucking cracked it out the park with that shit. Yeah. And that became the biggest 
Soul Assassin's oh, song yeah. Oh, yeah. of all time, Big essentially. Time. I mean, it, to this day, to at me. every cons, every oh, yeah. you know, sporting event, football game, basketball game. I think that should be considered one of the top ten hip hop songs of all time because I'll, I would give it that. Yeah, because realistically, like you said, any sporting event, that song is jumping off, and oh, I don't yeah. know how many movies mm. they've used it for. Insane in the brain is right there, but not as quite as out there as fucking jump around. I mean, people think we the people think it's our song to this day. I mean, we would cover it, <laughs> you know, with Prophets of Rage and we'd cover it with Cypress Hill and somehow people think it's our song. And but, you know, in in the family setting, yeah, you know, it belongs to our family, but realistically, it that's Everlast shit and it's one of the most well-known songs anywhere. I tell you, I've played this song in so many different settings for so many different people, and the reaction is the fucking same 30 years later, 20 years later, oh, yeah. whatever it is, bro. Like that song is the jump off, and there's very few hip hop songs that have that jump off. And Everlasting Mugs put that together, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm always proud of them two dudes for that shit because it's like, you know, it, it went to show you that. Everlast had and still does. He he has something. And whenever that 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 thing comes out in the music, he's going to bring something to the table that's going to elevate that. And they elevated each other with that shit right there, you know. Yeah, and incredible song. I I I you know like I get you know, I start thinking to myself, man, if 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 uh they had only done more together in that time after that. Like they they tried to do stuff and stuff like that. But you know, as every group happens, you know, you might want different producers, different production, and you know some things, some things that were there on the first album might not be there on the second or third. Right. Well, by you know, and I'm just gonna jump around for a second. When you guys dropped your third album, Temples of Boom, there was a song on there called Strictly Hip Hop. Yeah. And was it Muggs who said it? He said, "House of Pain ain't down with us." Yeah, they had a little. They had a little. Um, they had a little rub, <laughs> and you know, a little disagreement somewhere, and that was like the the separation for a while of of House of Pain from Soul Assassins. Me and Everlast were remained friends through all that, you know, because we're we're brothers. You know, we've been there for each other, and 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 times, you know that. You don't normally see people there for each other. You know, we are actually like a mirror of each other. You know, we're different skin, different fucking, you know, ethnic background and all that. But our lives are are pretty similar and we connected on that level. So when Muggs and, and him had this little thing going on, um, you know, we, we, Sen and I tried to stay neutral in that. Because we knew they were brothers. They would eventually get past whatever shit they were going through and reconnect and squash out whatever little shit that was happening. And it did. It, it eventually happened. Yeah. They, they talked it out and they put that shit aside and, and the family became one again. But it, it was crazy because people would ask us about that. And we're like, well, you're going to have to ask Muggs <laughs> about that shit right there because we don't know. And, and you know, the... The Soul Assassin's family, you know, Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Funk Dubious, but there was also the Hooligans, right. which had a young alchemist. Alchemist, yeah. So when you talk about the family tree, oh, yeah. and you talk about like what Alchemist is doing these days with mm -hmm. Freddie Gibbs oh, yeah. and what he's doing with Griselda yeah. and what he's done with, you know, Jay-Z and, and Nas and all them, it all started from Cypress Hill and the Soul Assassin. He was groomed for this shit, yeah. man. Uh, prize pupil, prodigy, you know. Um, he started with us at 13, 14 years yeah. old. And, His, and James Kahn's son, Scott Kahn, was the, other, Kahn was the other member of the Hooligans. Who was on uh, Hawaii Five-0. Yeah. And many other great things. Entourage. Yeah, yeah. Really dope actor. Mm -hmm. uh, those were my boys, right? So um, Amanda Demi, who was Amanda Shear at that time, uh, was, was uh, part of our management team at Buzz Tone with Happy Walters. Amanda comes to me and says, I got these two kids from Beverly Hills. Um, you should take a look at them. And, you know, I think she even might have told Muggs first. And Muggs was like, Beverly Hills? Nah, hell no. What are you talking about? 
right? And but I, I, you know, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's let's hear him. How you know? Let let's check them out. And she introduced me to them. They, she played me a couple couple songs, and uh, I, I saw some potential there. So I, you know, I met with them and I said, you know, let's hear what you got, right? And so, something to that degree. And uh, Alchemist started busting, and he sounded like a little grand poobah. You know, like he his his lyricism at 13, 14 years old was ridiculous, dog. I mean, I can't tell you, he would have outwrapped half of the dudes that were like, you know, veterans and pros at at the time. He was really dope as a as a kid. And Scott was pretty dope too. He had this energy. You know, he wasn't maybe as technically as sound as as, as Al, but his energy was like all there like he's he was that guy you yeah know, the driving and then, yeah and then mugs from what i understand help teach him how to produce yeah eventually and, later you know like yeah. hooligans happens first right which and doesn't it, really happen they, yeah, they never which, really which come didn't out really happen tommy yeah. boy wanted to sign them tommy boy did sign them uh but they made, never came out yeah we made their album they put out two singles out or maybe one and uh they got scared because they were, you know, white kids, they didn't know how people were going to take them. So, they put out the one. They they put out the one single and scratched the rest. But the album was produced by Lethal, DJ Lethal of House of Pain and Limp Bizkit, uh, the Baker Boys, and um, I can't remember one one other production group. But it was like maybe three different producers that that uh, we brought in to make beats for them. And the songs were pretty fucking good. It's just that, you know, at the time, they're two little white kids. Yeah. You know, and that just was not acceptable. So, you know, like Scotty, he went, got back into the acting and Al hung around us, you know, and he started hanging out with uh, Muggs and, and our boy Jay Turner, rest in peace, um, digging in crates, um, learning how to fuck with the ASR, learning how to put together beats, learning how, like, a lot of people don't know that um, on Temple of Boom, Alchemist was doing a lot of the crate digging at that time. Yeah, so at the time we were making Temple of Boom, a lot of people don't know Alchemist did a lot of the crate digging with Muggs yeah. and, and came up with some of that stuff. He didn't necessarily maybe put the beats together, but he came up with some of some of the samples and stuff like that along with Jay Turner. You know, the three of them worked on on that album extensively at Muggs' crib. And uh, that's that's where Alan got the bug to start producing. And uh, man, who knew yeah. that my dude was going to become a legend? Yeah, decade, bro, like, decades later. Decades later, yeah. I mean, you know, but that goes to show you like, yeah, you know, we brought him in and, and, and we, we, um, we sort of groomed him for this. Uh, me being an MC, you know, was with him in that point, and and uh, Muggs on the pr production end, giving him the game on that point. But like he did all his own work. Every door that he managed to get to and in and do some, he put that work in. That yeah. wasn't because of me or Muggs or anyone else. That's because of dedication and one hundred percent work that he put behind it. And that's that's why his name is so revered now. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it's it's a trip, you know, because <laughs> we saw something in in dude, because like, you know, at his age, he was just so fucking advanced in terms of of the way he was looking at things. And and uh it's great to see where he's at now, man. It's it's awesome. Well then the second album comes out, Black Sunday. And uh I feel like production wise, you guys and songwriting wise, you guys were just in your bag at that point such a great album where like every song is just such a perfect song and the first uh single insane in the membrane i was actually in that music video <laughs> yeah I, I was a uh, an 18 year old berkeley kid i used my friend's id who looked nothing like me <laughs> we went down to the dna lounge in, in san francisco and uh, man, that was the first time I ever seen you guys live after being such a huge fan. And I, I, we'll show a shot. It was actually like a, a very split second <laughs> shot where you see a young Vlad. Don't blink your eyes. Yeah, don't blink your <laughs> eyes. We'll show the screenshot, you know, of me in the audience. And I was, you know, stage diving yeah. and everything else it was like that. That's that that day. 
Yeah, no, it, it was great. And I remember uh, between uh, sets, well, you know, because, you know, when you do a music video, you're doing like a, yeah. a bunch of takes. Yeah. And uh, you guys had these like kind of uh, like bones, yeah. like in the ceiling, you know, hanging down from the ceiling. Yeah. I remember Send Dog was like, oh, this is Chub Rock right here. <laughs> you know, because I guess cause at the time <laughs> you guys were beefing with Chub Rock. Not, yeah. yeah it, you might have been the only people ever to, to, to beef with Chub Rock. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, man, you got a good memory. <laughs> I for do. That shit. I do. Um, yeah. No, I I totally remember him saying that. Now that you say that, <laughs> um, the bones were. Um, I think we we got from this dude who was doing shit for um, Nine Inch Nails, and you know all of our shit has all been skull and crossbones. So we fucking threw those up as like you know part of our set. But yeah, you know like Insane Brain was. Um, the first single, which I didn't realize was going to be the first single. You know, we thought it was a great song for the album, but, you know, we thought there was other songs that could have been a single. But, you know, we're like, hey, we're the artists. You know, we're, we're too close to this shit. Maybe Sony knows something we don't, right? So we go with it. But what they don't know is that it's, it's, a, it's a slight to Chub Rock, and it was a slight to Kid Frost. Oh really? I didn't know about the Kid Frost part. Yeah, Kid Frost and 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 Send Dog had a a little a little thing happening at the time, and uh, you know so and then so it was a combination of of something that happened between um, Frost and, and Send Dog, and then with Chub Rock it was uh, based off of that Yabba Dabba Doo video where um he got a diss y'all he, he it it seemed like he dissed us like no one ever really talked about it but we heard it and we were like is that a fucking diss time for some lyrics what the fuck is that and that you know it it got me i was like because i was a fan of chub rock and i still am yeah. you know what i mean i you know it it is what it is he was more of a clean cut rapper dope as fuck you know, we could not take that away from Chub Rock. To me, he was one of the dopest at that time. And I, I believe his his sword is still sharp if if you listen to tracks he's put out. Um, but, you know, being insulted by somebody who you get down with, that was like a, a fucking stab right in the heart because we had done shows with with Chub Rock. So for, for that shit to be out there, we're like, no, 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 no. It ain't going to happen like that. We don't, we don't allow anyone just to come at us. We are not those guys. We ain't going to just sit on our hands and let anyone take a shot at us. So whether we were wrong and we, we misinterpreted the line, um, I don't know. I, I think we were on the money with it because, I mean, he took my cadence and said, time for some lyrics. And that to me was like, you know, are you questioning my ability here? All right, so I'm, we're, we're going to shoot it off on you. You didn't mention our name. But you, what? But you, you spit this cadence and 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 said these particular lines. So you know, we came up with uh, with insane in the brain, and you know, he was at the time referencing himself as the flamboyant one, right? If you listen to some of some of the songs, the flamboyant one bring forth the fun, such and such, right? So the beginning line on my end was to the one on the flamboyant tip, I'll toss that ham in the frying pan, right? And um, it was pretty much <laughs> from there. Was Insane to the Brain or Insane to the Membrane, was that Cypress's biggest song ever? Uh, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, at that point, for sure. Well, just period, when you oh, look back, sure, yeah. when you look back yeah, on that one your catalog. In, that one, Kill a Man, Rock Superstar, those three are like, the big ones but what's a trip is is um you know for as big as that song is what we always hear the favorite favorite album is even though maybe the second album sold more than the third is the third album everybody loves that fucking third album for some reason temples of boom yeah okay because this album goes triple platinum yeah and you guys become the first rap group to have two albums in the top 10 right at the same time yes yeah, so which was uh goes, the first album starts to sell which, again, which yeah. goes back to what i was saying earlier yeah. how you know we dropped off the chart we started off at 170 or something we dropped off 
and Killer Man comes out and we're doing all these shows, all these great shows, and it's building our shit and people are starting to talk about us. So in about a year and a half to a two year span, we now create this this um this movement right and we're still on tour and sony comes out of the box and says hey listen you guys got to come off the road and do this fucking next album because your guys's momentum is building we need to get you guys out there quick so as we're making the album the first album is is starting to rise up and by the time we put out um the the second album with insane in the brain insane in the brain goes number one on the singles and it and it it uh we broke a record at that time we had a record for a long time until maybe drake broke it <laughs> some years back but you know it was one of the longest existing singles on the hip-hop chart wow as at number one wow okay and then we were the only hip-hop group at that time to have the the two albums so when black sunday comes out because of insane in the brain we enter at number one and by the time and by the time that happens the second album had hit number five so we had one in the number one slot and number five so black sunday at number one and self-titled album at number number five crazy it, 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 we did not think that some shit like that was capable for us yeah. because of who we were and what we were talking about and at the time, you know, there was people that loved us and then some pressed it absolutely hated us. Conservative motherfuckers, you know? Right. Because and, you guys were pushing the weed thing. Oh, yeah. And, and you guys performed on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And you smoked weed live on oh, stage yeah. Yeah. during your Saturday Night Live performance. Absolutely. And you got banned for life. For life. <laughs> a distinction that only a few of us hold. <laughs> and you guys didn't care. No, like, we whatever. didn't. We did everything without giving a fuck you know yeah. because we felt the minute we do is when it's all gonna it, the energy will flip you know what i mean and, yeah. but that plan didn't go according to plan you know it was supposed to be that um we we're we we're gonna do the song up into a point and then somewhere during the end of we ain't going out like that we were gonna smash our equipment like the who because we were doing that on tour that was mm -hmm. a thing we're like, fuck it. We're going to, it cost us some money. But we, again, we didn't give a fuck. It was about what we wanted people to walk away with. And, you know, we kill the fucking show and then smash our whole fucking set. Turntables, congas, everything. And people would just be in an uproar and they love that shit. So we said, okay, we're going to bring this shit to TV real quick. And this is what we're going to do. So we all mapped it out. We were supposed to, at the end, smash the equipment light the joints towards the end <laughs> somehow mugs flipped it and said you know what you know at the beginning of the song it says yo we're cypress hill they told us we couldn't smoke this fucking joint blah blah blah, blah but we ain't going out like that boom and he lit it and that set off the song and then everything else didn't go according to the plan <laughs> we never <laughs> smashed the set that we were supposed to because he sort of diverted from what the fucking plan was yeah. but in his diversion of the plan it was still an iconic moment mm -hmm. because he caught it they caught him right at the beginning there was no way to cut away from him so like they would if if we had done it in our original form trash the set then smoke like ah it's like after sex we just fucking <laughs> were calming our nerves right they could have cut away from us and not got that moment yeah so strategically you know even though we didn't get to wreck the set the way we properly would have, him busting out that joint at that time, it was a fucking iconic moment. And yeah, you know, we got banned, but it's it, it adds to our legend. You yep. know what I mean? We got a chance to get on Saturday Night Live and we got ourselves a band that's fucking awesome. Well, you guys go triple platinum with the second album, Black Sunday. Then a couple of years later, 95, you drop uh, your third album, Temples of Boom. Right. That goes platinum. Right. Hits number three on the Billboard uh, charts. And that song had Throw Your Set in the Air. Right. Which Ice Cube dropped <laughs> yeah. his song yeah, with yeah. a similar chorus. Yeah, Friday. Friday, which set off the beef with yeah. Cypress Hill and, uh, and Ice Cube. And we covered this during our last interview. Yeah. Um, and then West Side Connection got involved in that beef. Right. 
You know, I just interviewed Mac 10. Yeah, uh, that's, that's my boy, lot. man. Yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. Interesting story behind that interview. Also. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> we got it did, stories, it man. Didn't, it didn't come out for like a year because <laughs> he didn't want it out. And finally, we put it out. Yeah. Um, so, so now you have Cypress Hill and West Side Connection beefing. Uh, it does turn violent at, at certain times. Yeah, it got a little off the hook. Um, got a little off the hook, uh, with Ice Cube's chain being being taken and you guys yeah. showing it on stage. But eventually, you guys work it all out. Yeah, we worked it out eventually, and that was, uh, you know, thanks to Mac Ten. Do you know Mac Ten calls me, you know, because you know he's a Damu and so am I, and and you know, I thought I thought he realized, you know, this is all going nowhere, in a in a hurry, and you know. Chances are some of our people are going to get tangled up and shit's going to happen and, and really, you know, turn serious. I mean, it, you know, it was already serious enough that, like, you know, his chain got brought to me and <laughs> I was petty about it and I fucking flaunted it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but it it's at the time, it's what had to happen between us, I think, you know, um, and it made for a great battle, whatever side you think one or whatever it you know it was a clash of the titans and um you know but i was i was very like um it it bothered me because it was somebody that i had a lot of love for but that was your friend yeah this was my friend and 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 it ha and it had to happen um but uh yeah you know mac 10 calls me after all these things transpiring he says hey man you know Let's let's talk about it like men and let's let's figure something out because this is this is all some bullshit. I said, you know, I couldn't agree more. Let's, you know, hey, listen, I got nothing against you. I know you had to, you know, ride for dude. And uh I understand that because if if I'm in your position, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would have did the same thing. You know, if someone puts you on, you gotta be in their corner. Yeah. And so I understood that. And and uh, you know, we were able to squash our shit and you know, he was the 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 person that um, got me and Ice Cube to talk personally, and I think we nope. talked on January first, ninety nineteen ninety seven, and uh, you know, it, we had a, a cool conversation. We we explained to each other, you know, why certain shit went the way it went, and then we squashed it and, and agreed to never, never fucking diss each other again. Mm. And then we go on to work with each other on various things like uh, Shaq's Superman, Super Friends thing with Pete, Peter Gunn. And then uh, eventually with Warren G on Get You Down or whatever it's called. I can't yeah. remember the name of that track. Grown Man Shit. Yeah. And then we did, I think we did one more somewhere. But, you know, we've never were able to get together and do something just him and I without us being featured on somebody else's shit. Yeah. That was always... A dream of mine to happen for for Cuba and I to, you know, after all this bullshit, to actually do something together. Like even if it was an EP or something like that, just you know, showing that all that shit is truly like, right? History. Well, I mean, because not only were you guys friends, but um, Mugs produced uh, on yeah. Ice Cube's album. He did um, uh, make it rough. There was that, but then there was also. Um, uh, check your check, check yourself. yourself. The original yeah. version yeah. Of, of check yourself which before you wreck yourself, which I like better. I like better than the I, the remix is the, cool. The remix is cool. I like the it remix, was more popular, but, but the, the original the original is the yeah. business yeah. to me. I, I agree. I agree. So then you guys drop your fourth album, uh, which goes gold, right? Which had Dr. Green Thumb on it, right? Which is one of my favorite Cypress Hill songs. Cold well. classic. Love that song. Yeah, love that song. Thank uh, you. I bumped the hell out of that one. They oh. wanted me to change it. They wanted me to do an insane in the brain style song and change the lyrics, change the chorus, because they felt they could not market that song. And they, you know, they they, they saw it as a waste. And I stuck to my guns. And you know, credit to Sony that you know they would let us crash and burn, or win and and and, and have the the victory, whatever, whatever it be, they would let us ride or die on our own decisions. They would merely suggest. And I told them, no, nah, I'm not going to change Dr. Green Thumb. You already have Insane in the Brain. I'm not going to make an Insane in the Brain part two. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to their surprise, not mine, 
it became one of our cult classics. Like, so if you play Insane in the Brain at a Cypress Hill show, you get the normal pop. People fucking go nuts, right? When Dr. Green Thumb goes on, it gets that same fucking pop and it's less popular song. It's a less of a popular song. Mm -hmm. And reason being is that they, you know, obviously radio was still not playing pro weed songs <laughs> weed at songs, the time. Yeah. And Sony didn't place any ads for it. They didn't really get behind it, but it grew and it became a huge song in Europe. Like the mm. single blew the fuck up out there. Okay. And it became one of our biggest, our biggest songs. But in relation to that album that it's on, you know, Sony is at various times thought we were over. Like certain people at Sony thought we were over. Only Donnie Einer really had faith in us, you know, that was tremendous. Like these guys can do it if you put the right shit behind them. And obviously, you know, Chris and Joe before Rough House dissolved, you know, when we had Rough House in the situation, we had two support systems. We had Rough House and their staff, and we had Sony because of Donnie Einer, whether whoever believed in the project or not. And, you know, as, as it happens, you know, in, in with record companies, and you know this better than anyone, uh, situations and staffs change. And so yeah. people that might have been there for your first two albums that had the formula of how you get this, this particular band out there, how you break their music, and who do you reach out to, in terms of like the fan base, how to ignite it, those people have a formula. But you know, if they don't get, if they don't get raised in 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 that company, if they don't get raised up or, or a better position, they move on to different places. And a lot of these people in key positions move on to different situations. So now you got people that aren't necessarily familiar with with how your shit is broken, right? Or you know, how, how do we put this album out? How do we get this engagement? They don't know that because they're new to the fucking fold. And sometimes you get the mentality of these new cats. Well, this band's already broke. It could sell itself. We don't need to do much. Let's just put it out in the water and it'll fucking sell itself. <laughs> Let's focus on Jean Forte. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, which, which, who doesn't pop off? Who, who doesn't pop yeah. off? Well, shout As out a to matter John. of fact, he goes to jail. Yeah, Shout out for, to John, John for, for a massive cocaine bust. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they they put a bunch of resources into him and less into us. Yeah, you know what I mean. More efforts, and and that was people that were a part of the team to move Cypress Hill's next album. And so when you have that type of mentality, you figure a group can sell itself. You're not putting as much resource and as much effort. So with that album and the fact that we didn't want to change Dr. Green Thumb. They're just like, all right, well, let them do their thing, and it went gold. It didn't. It didn't do platinum like the the, the three previously before them. Mm -hmm. So they definitely thought we were fucking over at that point. Right. So then the next album comes out in two thousand, right. Skull and Bones, which had rock superstar right. and, and rap superstar. Right. The the rap version of that right. same song, which ended up becoming one of your biggest songs once right. again. And that song does one point five million. I mean, not not the song, but the album. The album, yeah. And so, you know, you have this drop that happened here. You know, the last album, the, the Temple of Boom did 1.5, and then this one goes gold, and then this next one does 1.5. So it went to show you that the staff that we had on, on that previous album, they weren't motivated. But the staff that came in for Skull and Bones, they seen what we had done in terms of creating this album that had half hip hop orientated songs like that raw, grimy, mug style shit. And then the stuff that was more hybrid with, with rock and, and uh, hip hop, with metal and hip hop, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, the alternative, right? So you had one department that was motivated because of those particular songs and then the alternative department motivated because fuck, they got something that they could put onto the K-Rocks and the the, the stations like that right so everybody was excited so they did a master push so then this album does great you know and they're like oh shit cypress what we what were we thinking they're, they're fucking franchise we got to fucking push 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 and that album does really well you know and then like it always happens 
the next album comes and they sit on their hands because you know they're resting on the successes of the last one. Well, you know, we don't really need to do much. Let's just do this, this, that, and right. This is Stone Raiders. Yeah, and which uh, didn't crack the top fifty yeah. in the charts for the first time ever. Yeah, yeah, and that was a tough one. That was a tough one for us because we knew that that album had bangers on it. But, you know, we never really made albums in terms of, or made songs in terms of getting singles. Mm -hmm. We were lucky to have singles. We were lucky that, <laughs> that, that Sony saw singles in our songs because we were always just trying to make dope albums. And we didn't give a fuck if they went platinum or not. We just wanted to make dope albums. But you become accustomed when you hit this fucking, this standard. So when we didn't hit it on the album, you know, we were really fucking pissed off because we felt like Sony was like giving up on the push. And now a whole other new team was there. And now our our um our our main support system in Rough House is not there. So it's like we really have less support backing up our plays here. So, you know, with that drop off, you know, we knew, okay, well, you know, our time with Sony may be coming to an end because mm -hmm. like if if some if if they don't if only donnie is seeing it and no one else is seeing it then you know maybe you know it's 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 time to fucking you know leave the leave the fucking leave home well right around that time in 2000 that's when everlast and eminem start to beef yeah <laughs> and uh, uh that was tough too i mean apparently you know, the story goes that Eminem didn't acknowledge Everlast in a hotel room or yeah. in a hotel lobby. I think it was a hotel lobby in an elevator. In an elevator. In an elevator because I think it was uh, for the wake up show. Mm -hmm. They okay. were both going and coming from the wake up show. Okay. And uh, Everlast ends up doing the eardrums pop remix with Dilated Peoples where he took some shots at Eminem. Eminem drops I Remember and then Quitter. And apparently... Everlast had a response record yeah. to Eminem. Yeah. Where he was actually singing yeah. as opposed to rapping. Right. And you heard this song. Um, he didn't let me hear the song. No? He, 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 he let me hear some words from the song. Like he sung me some lines from the song. And it, it, it was pretty fucking dope. Like he didn't let me hear the song in full because it wasn't all the way done. Mm -hmm. But he, he gave me the fucking idea of it. And uh, had this song come out, it, it would have fucking splashed heavy. Because, I mean, you know, Everlast is a, you know, they're both exceptional fucking MCs, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that people were maybe um, underestimating what Everlast was capable of. Because by that time, he was doing Whitey Floor. Yeah, he was singing more than rapping. Yes, he was singing more than rapping yeah. at that time. So, it, you know, you, you sort of begin to doubt an ability of this of this dude because he's doing more of this than what you know him to be doing and i'll just tell you he's one of them mcs that you cannot fuck around and underestimate because you know he'll light a, a major fire um but he didn't end up putting that song out which is probably for the best because it would have it would have uh, exacerbated shit and stretched that beef out longer because the fucked up part about it is they both fucking loved each other. You know, yeah. they both had enormous respect and love for each other. You know, like Everlast was like, man, hell yeah. Another white kid that's fucking killing it. And, you know, Everlast, I mean, uh, Eminem to tell it, he'll say that one, one of his influences or one of the guys he looked up to was Everlast. So of course. It was, it was just miscommunication and, you know, the timing of it was all fucked up. And I, you know, fortunately I was able to get in between it and squash it out. Oh, so you got them. them talking together? I didn't get them talking, but I got them to squash mm. it. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, um, they both called me and said, hey man, can you talk to your boy? <laughs> I mean, yeah. with that, with Eminem, I, you know, it was more like, we, we never really talked on, on a phone conversation. It was more in person. And I talked mm -hmm. to him on this tour uh, or on at the show that we did, I said, "Hey, you know, he don't really, he don't hate you like that, dude. You know, like this is all a misunderstanding. You know, I think y'all have a respect for each other there that hasn't been said. 
But like, you know, y'all y'all shouldn't be beefing. Let's just squash this shit out, you know? Yeah. You guys are both I love both you guys and I don't want to see you guys fucking beefing like this. And fortunately, you know, they because they had that respect for each other and it was a misunderstanding, they were able to fucking squash that shit. And I remember seeing Everlast like cheer am on for something that he put out like a little bit later after that that it, it was like some some dope shit he put out i can't remember what song it was but you know he gave him props on that and to me you know i always thought they should have made you know some songs together even if it was just one it would have been fucking oh, yeah. huge they could still do it yeah you know i'm sure both of them are going to watch this interview i know eminem watches vlad hey TV. listen guys do the song and then feature me with you. There you go. <laughs> and let Vlad TV premiere it. Yeah, let Vlad there, there premiere we go. this shit. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys drop a few more albums. You, in 2004, you drop Till Death To Us Part. Yeah, which was our last album on Sony. Yeah. Then 2010, you did Rise Up. Right, which was with the EMI. Good. And, you know, the two albums, those last two, um, they were tough. You know, with 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 the the Till Death Do Us Part album, we knew it was our last album with Sony, and you know we knew that that based off of the album beforehand, that you know chances are this album's probably gonna not do as well as that one. Mm -hmm. Maybe it does, but you know the way that things the, the way that things happen in the industry when, especially when the label stops pushing is that there's a fucking drop you know what i mean um i think our music went past what they were looking for an artist at that time and they were just looking to fulfill the deal and do right by us because we actually owed them one more album but i talked them into letting that particular album be the last or it was actually a greatest hits album or some shit like this because you know we just we saw man the support was fleeting at that point and we didn't want to dead our group on sony that would have been fucking horrible now with emi it was more out of necessity like it had been six years we hadn't put anything out and that was the the album that we did mostly without mugs you know mugs was uh working on several other fucking things at the time mm -hmm. And we we were pressed. I mean, you know, it was like, fuck, you know, we either come out with something right now or we ain't come out with anything else. Yeah. So we did rise up and I took production duties on myself. I, I made some of the beats there, but I played the executive producer role on 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 that one and, and brought other producers to the table on that one. And, you know, it was with EMI and and, you know, they were bringing it in through Snoop Dogg, you know, because, you know, we had have this mm -hmm. relationship with Snoop and Snoop wanted to be the one to bring Cypress Hill to EMI. Unfortunately, it didn't work with EMI because they just did not know what the fuck to do with Cypress Hill. You know, they tried, but I don't think they knew all the bases to touch. And some of the things that I suggested, they, you know, they, they were interested in doing them, but they just never got around to doing them. And I don't know if it's because we signed a one-off album and didn't sign like, you know, a multiple deal album like, you know, normally you would do. We signed a one-off. So, you know, for those, they're only going to spend so much money and so much effort into putting a fucking, you know, putting out the album if they're not getting you for a long term. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then the next album, two years later, Elephants on Acid. Elephants on Acid. Mugs Nestle, comes back. Which we bring Mugs back. And you guys, he does all the production. And on he it. does all the production on that. Yeah. yeah. Which was, it was, uh, it was interesting to do that album because, it, you know, like he's a, he's a different sort of motivator mugs, man. You know, he went back to the style, like when, like it could be considered like when we didn't have shit. So let's just say you have this big studio, but you got this little shit pre-production room that you know you do all the 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 beginning stuff on mm -hmm. and then you take it to the big room and put all the bells and whistles on where some groups would start off in the big room and just do everything there right you know he had us in the small room where it was hot and gritty and fucking you know much like when we were working in the old days you know what i'm saying 
and it brought this this vibe like we were you know just starting out again and uh but it, it was it was cool because he got out of us what i feel like he needed to get out of us in 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 terms of this particular album he wanted to do it different than than most albums the the style of writing the content and and the delivery on some of the shit and and obviously it's production because it was you know I, i'm gonna say that temple of boom was probably the most dark dusty album that we had in in all of our albums but this one was darker a little dustier but with more psychedelic sensibility to it yeah and that's well it's you know i'm looking on the wikipedia page that's the ninth album but then there was some other stuff yeah there's stuff the, in between those grandos exodus and stuff like that so it's really like about 10 11 albums uh yeah yeah that that it yeah it should be 10 or 11 11 it should be exitos yeah. and and the greatest hits deal that we did after yeah so 11 after. 11 albums 11 albums was so it crazy like looking back and say wow we were signed for eight <laughs> you know yeah. we had one of them old school hip-hop record deals <laughs> where they sign you for your forever fucking life right <laughs> they think that you're not gonna fulfill this deal one it's it's a gamble that they sign you for these eight albums but either way it's a write-off right so you probably most groups that got signed to that deal made two albums at the most if that yeah if that there's you know hand of a handful of us from the golden era that actually made more than that yeah but i think we're probably the only hip-hop group that stood on one label all that time and fulfilled the deal we didn't get dropped too short i think might have been the other one yeah we didn't get dropped and we didn't buy out of our contract mm -hmm. we actually fulfilled our deal and left amicably amicably and and in a good place with sony well and then in uh 2016 you formed prophets of rage yeah. which i forgot was a, a public enemy song yeah with chuck d and um members of rage against the machine or is it just is it just tom morello uh were there multiple? no 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 uh, uh, with prophets of rage band it was um three guys from, from rage against the machine three guys was, from rage Brad Wilk, the drummer, uh, Timmy C, the bassist, and Tom Morello, Tom Morello. the general, <laughs> and Commandante. Yeah. Um, and then there was Lord and Chuck from PE. And Chuck D. And myself. Yeah. And then, from what I understand, this hit like number one on the rock charts. Yeah. I mean, I never, you know, with, <laughs> with that band, I never really kept up on on what it was doing in terms of, of charts or sales or, and stuff like that, because to me, it was more of a platform with these guys to talk about shit that I don't normally talk about, whether it be my solo stuff or or with uh, with uh, Cypress Hill or any of the various groups I've been in, like Serial Killers and Psycho Realm and shit like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Psycho Realm. Similarly, you know, we talked about things sort of like with Prophets of Rage, but it, it, it two different fucking deals. But you know, it, it was. Uh, it was a trip to see the response of this group because you either loved us or you hated us. You know, um, there there was people that maybe didn't give two shits about us. They were like, well, I don't give a fuck about politics, so I ain't even tripping off of what these guys are talking about. I want to listen to this party shit over here. But um, you either loved or you hated that band, you know? And uh, we got a lot of love out there, though. It, it, was, it was a crazy experience to to put these group of guys together you know on paper we knew it worked it looked good on paper yeah psh, rage against the machine cyber so public enemy fucking looks good <laughs> right that's a tour yeah let alone a band that, that, <laughs> you know that, what I'm that's a that's a that's a stadium show in a lot of different countries yeah and we started rehearsing uh for it in secret and at first it was like you know like oh shit what are we what what are we what are we doing you know what i'm saying is this really the the move could we really pull this off? And then I think in the second or third week of rehearsals, we hit a stride. We're like, oh shit, something's coming together here. Because it was, uh, at, at, at the beginning, it was us doing Rage Against the Machine songs because hmm. we felt like, you know, Tom and, and the other guys felt like, fuck, this is the time for this music because of all the shit that was going on. It was around the 2016, 2016 campaign. And they felt like, 
this message needs to be out there. And at the time, you know, Zach and them weren't doing stuff. So, you know, to get this message out there, Tom thinks, let's form a band, another band, and let's go play this shit because this music is needed right now. So, you know, he calls Chuck. Well, at first he calls the other, the other two guys, uh, Tim and, and Brad. Then they call Chuck. Chuck is, you know, is, from what he told me, he was kind of halfway in. And then when they talked to me, that's when he committed fully. You know, because yeah. Chuck and I had always talked about doing shit together. But you know how it is, you know, artists with, with schedules and, and PE works a lot, Cypress Hill works a lot. There was very little time for us to find something to do. But Tom caught us at a time where neither of our bands were, were like actively touring mm -hmm. at that moment. And, you know, I, shit, I was like, psh, I was like, yes, before he even asked me. <laughs> I knew I had inside information. You cannot hide nothing from Dr. Green Thumb. Now, I get the call like, hey, these dudes are going to call you. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. They're not going to call. I've heard this talk before, you know, because we talked about it many years ago, mm -hmm. forming something, but it, it just didn't happen. Audio Slave happened instead. And, you know, so I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. They're going to call me. Sure, they're going to call me. Okay, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll call you when they call me, dog. Boom. About an hour later, <laughs> I get a fucking call from Brad. Hey, his... Uh, or a text, has, has, has Morello hit you yet? I'm like, no. Is he supposed to? I was kind of playing stupid and he was like, yeah, 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 let me know when he does. I'm like, all right, cool. And right then and there, that was the validation, right? I was like, okay, yeah, these motherfuckers are gonna call me. So it was like, yes, before he even asked me because I saw the, pot the potential in, in what it is they were trying to do. I could say something that normally people don't hear me fucking saying. And again, you know, when we, we started getting our, our legs on us in terms of playing the Rage songs, and then we actually played those, those shows where we mixed up Rage Against the Machine songs with, with um, Cypress Hill and Public Enemy songs, hmm. and then creating one new song, people were fucking like, they reacted to it like crazy. And we had this chemistry on stage, so we felt like, hey man, let's make this more than just this happening. Let you know, us playing these songs because this is happening. We have a chemistry. Let's try to lock that down in the studio. So we got into the studio and we we found out that we had chemistry there. So that's what prompted the EP and then, you know, eventually the 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 album. And uh it was fun, man, you know, because everybody had some great creative input to to throw in and that, that's why you know we had such fun making that first album and and it was fun being with them on tour because we were all just sort of locked in on you know one one particular goal which is go out there and say something to these people and wake them up but rock the fuck out of them and we did that <laughs> well and then last year you guys get a a star on the hollywood walk of fame yeah, the first Latino hip hop group to have a star. How does that feel, oh, being man. an LA native to walk down Hollywood Boulevard Crazy. and to step on your own star? Being, you know, that's something that's so aspirational. Yeah, like you know, you good. have all the greatest Hollywood music people are all on this on this street, and here you are walking on your own star. It was surreal, you know. To be honest, I mean, you know, we grew, like you said, we grew up out here and and yeah. uh walk in those streets you see those stars of the people that had been there you know 20 years before you even saw that goddamn star you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. you, you see that and you're like you know if you're an artist or an entertainer of any kind yeah you you might visualize or dream one day your star would would be there but hell we didn't think about that because we knew exactly who we were and what we were talking about and the type of shit that you know <laughs> that we were facing throughout the industry so that was something that we did not see coming you know but it was it was great that we got acknowledged and the fact that uh so many fucking fans showed up for that and george lopez an exhibit that came and spoke on our behalf and chuck d who was there and my man burner who came to mm. represent there was so many that i did not see would would show up 
you know, for us there, you know, because you just never know how those things are going to turn out. And, you know, the fans were there and and some of our, our peers that we love and look up to, they were there. And, and uh, it was it was a great moment, man. I mean, you know, the fact that we got recognized through, throughout all the bullshit that we had to go through. Right. And, and, and uh, the ups and downs. I mean, you know, because without success, I mean, with success, there is no success without the ups and downs. Of course. And, and uh, you know, that was just one of the you know, acknowledgments that we got for all those, those ups and downs, man. And it, it's, it's a trip that we have it. And, uh, you know, one day I'll... My daughter was there to see it. That was key, man. You know, the, my son, he was working that day, but my daughter. He, da your son couldn't get off work that day? No, he couldn't get off. Uh, that's whack. Bastards wouldn't let him off. You know <laughs> but, um, you know, they could, they could, you know, visit the star and see the yep. accomplishment there and inspire them. You know, whether it, it doesn't have to necessarily be that they want their star. If that's what they're shooting for, Yes. And I will support them with whatever they want to do, but like you know, just that the 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 main um, thing they should take away from it is it's the work you put into whatever it is that you're you're trying to do. Yeah, we uh, in spite of the ups and downs, in spite of like the walls put up and obstacles that that were put up in front of us, you know, we were able to get around them because we decided we're going to put work behind this shit and not take no for an answer and be unapologetic for the things that we do and most of all be responsible and accountable for some of the shit we do because yeah that's a part of it you know well i mean here you are almost 30 years ago rapping about weed when no other rappers were really doing that on that yeah. level and now 2020 marijuana is legalized in, in how many states now I'm gonna say it's probably uh, the last count was 17, but maybe 17 it's states. maybe it's 22 now. Maybe yeah. There's some that that have medical legislation like we had here before it got legal, where it's not necessarily legal, but they have medicinal. Um, it's not recreational yet, but I mean, though, it, it's everything is a work in progress. I mean, everywhere is opening up, even in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, you know, Virginia just flipped some of their their cannabis laws mm -hmm. over there to to be more uh you know to soften up on on cannabis yeah laws I'm, over there i think you could possess up to an ounce now whereas before you're oh yeah. going to fucking jail oh yeah i mean it just kind of shows how cypress hill was on the right side of history we tried to be we didn't know that that you know yeah i mean because because let's just keep it 100 in 1991 if you would have told me hey marijuana is going to be legal in the United States, just like Amsterdam, it's going to be yeah. like, yeah, okay, all right. yeah. America, a, nah, it'll it'll never ever happen. We, you know, we all and, and look, we all wished and hoped and and imagined that it could, right? You know what I mean? But it took the people to put the work in. You know, mm -hmm. we inspired some of the people that put the work in in terms of showing up to those rallies and fucking, you know getting those signatures and the petitions signed and all that stuff you know it it inspired a lot of people and and along with us the other artists that that chose to put cannabis on their back too you mm -hmm. know we all did our service for for the legalization of cannabis and and you know we, we I don't think we thought it would it would be as soon as it came mm. but we knew it was possible it was just when are pe people going to get past the stigmas, like the, the false propaganda? Well, now you actually have marijuana stocks, mostly yeah. mostly in Canada. Yeah. Or all in Canada, for what I understand. Which is a trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you yourself, being that you were so much ahead of the curve and one of the spokesmen and faces of it, did you really financially benefit from marijuana becoming legal, whether it's getting involved in dispensaries or the growing operations or getting early stocks or whatever else. Did you really benefit or did well, other people benefit and you're just happy to be part of the movement? Well, at first, no. At first, we did not benefit, um, but that wasn't what it was for. It was, it was basically for the movement to be pushed forward. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I benefited later after I opened up the shops. Um, with, you, have, you have how many shops? Uh, six now. Six dispensaries. 
wait, is it six? It's, uh, we have one in Los Angeles, close to downtown, one in Silmar, one in Cathedral City in Palm Desert, um, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Humboldt County. What are they all called? Dr. Green Thumb. Dr. Green Thumb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and you know, so once that happened, yeah, you know what, our, our company is making money via the via the um the shops but like the initial you know in in the beginning yeah no it, it was more work than anything and it, it's still work now because of of the way things are but realistically Taxes oh yeah i mean because well, from what i understand and, and you see this with a number of dispensaries that go out of business i heard it's a very very rough business to be in it is if you don't have a brand right you right. know it's like it's not like you're you're selling weed illegally, where right. it's just you know half of it is profit or whatever. Right. With all the taxes and all the hurdles, oh, and yeah. the security and, and everything else like that, um, you know, Reggie Wright Jr. is in prison right now because his dispensary got shut down and he tried to basically keep moving weed yeah. <laughs> under the yeah. table, that's, which is why he's in prison right now. That's the problem though, is that if you have a, um, a licensed dispensary, you don't want to put it at risk by doing all the other shit. Yeah. And you know, um, that is something that we always have to keep in mind as, as operators and owners of, of the dispensaries, who's doing what, you know, that's why security and, and um, you know, all of our, dispensaries have all these camera systems so that we can mm -hmm. keep track of what everybody's doing because you know you don't want any strikes against your license because it is expensive to operate especially if you're not vertical right vertical means that you have all these things that yeah, you're, you're creating you're, it creating. you're packaging it you're selling right. it you're marketing you're, you're it. growing it growing you're it, producing yeah. it you're 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 manufacturing you're packaging you're distributing you're are, are you guys are you guys actually growing as well yeah. or no Okay, so you have your own farm. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that was before we had the before we had the dispensaries. We had the farms. I mean, we've been in the game for so long as cultivators. You know, yeah. My team, you know, and, um, and we created the Dr. Green Thumb brand out of the out of the products we were cultivating and stuff like that. Eventually, it turned from that to, you know, being cultivators of this of of cannabis products to owning a shop and being shop owners and then putting our licensed cannabis because our cultivations is our, our lights our cultivations are licensed too so at every aspect man um when you're when you're vertical and you don't have the hedge fund money or the financing and right, stuff because people are putting billions oh yeah yeah i remember burner had this video where there was like this operation i think in vegas yeah that looked like a hundred million dollar operation it yeah. had its own like it's damn near like a city right where they're growing yeah massive amounts exactly and you know it costs money to grow that massive amount and it and it, and it takes a distribution system that's consistent yeah to get rid of all that product because if you don't have the 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 path to to get rid of that product and put it into all these licensed stores um you're sitting on that product and it has an expiration date. Yeah. And if you don't sell it, you take a fucking huge loss. Now, what happens is that shit could be fire. But if no one knows who produced it, if no one knows the brand, no one's going to fuck with it until somebody comes and says, you know what, I'll white label that for my brand. I remember when the dispensaries first started out, you'd go to a dispensary and it'd be a big jar. Right. And he'd be like, yeah, I want that OG Kush. I, I want that purple. I want whatever. Now you go into any dispensary and it's all prepackaged, yeah. sealed, a certain brand name. Yeah. Associate. It's not like a type of weed. It's a brand name. Yeah. Well, um, it'll have the type of weed. Yeah. But the it's packaging, still, you know, but like I like. It highlights the brand. New Season is a brand that, right. I, that I use or, um, you know, there's a few other brands that, that I like, but it's like, it's really changing. Yeah. Did you invest in weed stocks at all or not really? No, nah, fuck that. Why is that? They're not because Because I, I remember, you know, me being a big stock investor and i have lad stocks and everything when i first launched about a year and a half ago the main thing was like what weed stocks should i buy weed stocks weed stocks weed stocks and then all of it came crashing down yeah the so past year. i i got i you know i got money in stocks too so like i'm very in tune to that shit. but the problem is with weed stocks is i didn't find them stable enough yet 
You know, it's still a new industry. Yeah, and that's and, why I never invested. I just don't know enough about the industry to throw my money in. It's still like the cannabis industry. Yeah, you know, in terms of black market, has been here, for God knows how long, right. right? And it's still here. And and it's still here. But in terms of the the white market, the legal market, um, it's still new. In spite of being around for what five, six, seven years, some ten, some shop owners mm -hmm. have had their 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 shit for 10 years but this was before that it was actually legal you know what i mean and uh it's it's uh it's one of those things where you have to build the brand otherwise all that shit you know like um the the stability in in cannabis stocks is is it, to me it just ain't there because this 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 legalized business hasn't even been around ten years yet, and and yeah. to 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 create this stability. So when it came about, I knew a bunch of people that were investing, and they were like, "Hey, man, you should get down." I'm like, "You go ahead." Yeah, uh, you well, know. Look, I mean, for everyone who's watching, if Be Real is not investing in weed stocks, you probably shouldn't be either. I mean, it's a it's a gamble. You <laughs> a gamble. you can you can you can go out there and, and put your money in some of these stocks and and hold and sit on it. You know what I mean? And and and, and you you're not going to make money fast. That is first there, there for go. certain. But for me, I'm not willing to risk that until you know it's legal everywhere in the yeah. United States. Right. Because Burner said the same thing. Yeah. Burner doesn't have money in weed stocks either. Yeah, He's one no. of the big weed guys as well. Fuck with his no. old cookies brand. Listen, when when it's only you know when the the the, the main stocks are up in the can Canadian fucking trade uh, stock market, and not necessarily in the American stock market. I mean, why why would we do that? There you go. I mean, you could still make money in the Canadian stock market, but realistically. In the United States, we don't have full legalization yet. So for me, it would be ridiculous to invest in any stock until it's legal nationwide. Yeah. You know, it's legal nationwide in Canada. That's why it's on the stock market there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I mean, if you want to get into some stocks, maybe the Canadian ones, but even then, I, you know, I'm not taking yeah. that chance until we're legal here all across the board. And then, you know, I'll, I'd have to do research on what stock is the right one in the cannabis trade. There you have it. Uh, Be Real, such an honor to really sit down and do a proper interview for the first time. And, you know, you and I have spoken about this before. When I first decided to seriously become a DJ, the very first mixtape I did yeah. was a Soul Assassin's I remember that. Mixtape, yeah. Where I, I took all my favorite Cypress Hill songs, Psycho Realm songs, Funk Dubious songs. No, I remember House it well, yeah. Songs, and I remember I put it out. And this was actually the first internet mixtape. Yeah. Honestly, there were no mixtapes on the internet during that time. I took it, I mixed it, and I put it up as an MP3 file on djvlad.com, which is no longer around. And I remember people were like, oh, yeah, man, we, we bumped this in, in Sweden at our rec center all the time. And that's what really, you know, because I love the music so much, which inspired me to make that. And from there... That's how I started my journey as DJ Vlad, which eventually led to where I am today yeah. with Vlad TV. But it just goes to show how much love I have for what you guys created. You know, and I've always heard that. And I've seen it from right right when I heard from you, mm. uh, heard about you. Yeah, before and, we ever met or anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and seeing what you were doing, man. And then, you know, to eventually meet and become friends and yeah. then see like each other's paths, yeah. you know, go where they where they have gone, man. It's... it's uh, I mean, fucking hip hop is a great thing, man. Mm, you know, yeah. it connected all of us in different ways, you know, and, and in different times. Yeah. And a lot of us are still connected. You know what I mean? And we got to have you come down on the Dr. Green Thumb show. I'm there. I've already, I've already been on there before and yeah, I'll come we, again. We got to have you come on the new one, the, the podcast. Yeah, Let's do it. Word up, man. Until hey, and next thanks, time. And thanks for having me, man. Of course. Be real. Cypress Hill, man. Until Word next up, brother. time. Peace. Hell yeah.